Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. I welcome you to the uh, final uh, session of the day. And uh, this is going to be a very intensive and rich uh, postgraduate course. And the theme of our course is palliative care of decompensated cirrhosis, non-liver transplant candidates. And this is going to be an interactive case-based discussion. Uh, this session is compo composed of extremely pressing issues that are dealt with by hepatology teams worldwide in the management of patients with advanced liver disease and its associated complications. The consultants who will be presenting their talks in this session include Dr. Nazash Bhatt, Dr. Shanil Khadr, Dr. Om Prakash, Dr. Nasir Hassan Luck from Pakistan, and Dr. Farooq Khan and Dr. Nadeem Tehami from the United Kingdom, Dr. Raja Effendi from Malaysia, and Dr. Bilal Hamid from the United States. The complications of advanced liver disease are all invariably and individually life-threatening, and prompt identification is key to prolonging survival, preferably long enough to, uh, uh, to undergo liver transplantation. However, this patient population has a unique physiology, and understanding is essential to manage routine day-to-day -day issues as well as associated systemic diseases of organ systems other than the liver. Finally, the much overlooked psychosocial aspect of dealing with such patients and developing an understanding of the issues that are faced by them and their families is something without which we cannot hope to achieve empathic and humane management. The session will look into these problems and challenges individually, dissect them, and present realistic solutions to the clinicians on the front line of managing patients with liver disease. The first talk of the day is going to be delivered by Dr. Nazash Bhatt who is currently serving as an associate professor in the Department of Gastroenterology at the Jinnah Postgraduate Medical Center, Karachi, Pakistan. The topic of our uh, talk is going to be variceal upper GI bleeding. Uh, gastrointestinal bleeding is one of the major causes of death in patients with liver cirrhosis, and variceal bleeding represents the main source of hemorrhage. And even though in the last uh, three decades, uh, survival has been improved, uh, due to various uh, modalities that have been inducted in the treatment armament. However, mortality is still significantly high, and decompensated patients pose a complex challenge requiring a multidisciplinary approach that is crucial to improve their survival. And, uh, and now we shall initiate the talk by Dr. Nazish Bhatt. Assalamu alaikum and good evening, everyone. So everybody is listening to me. My sound is clear. Yes, ma'am, you're, you're clear. Okay. Uh, first, I would like to thank the organizer of this uh, meeting for inviting me for this presentation. Uh, the topic is given to me is variceal bleeding, and there are uh, lots of aspects in variceal bleeding. I'll try my best to cover all the aspects of the variceal bleeding. So what are esophageal varices? Esophageal varices are dilated, tortuous veins that are usually found in the submucosa of the lower esophagus, but many develop high in the esophagus or extend into the stomach. So this condition is almost always caused by the portal hypertension. So portal hypertension results from both an increase in resistance to portal blood flow and enhanced portal blood flow. So varices are present in 30 to 40% of patients with compensated cirrhosis and in 60 to 85% of patients with decompensed cirrhosis at the time of diagnosis of cirrhosis. So uh, as you all guys know that untreated varices have a significant risk of bleeding. So it is important to determine who should undergo screening endoscopy to diagnose varices. So upon the diagnosis of the esophageal uh, uh, upon cirrhosis, you have to screen for uh, uh, esophageal varices through upper GI endoscopy. So it is recommended you have to go for the upper GI endoscopy to rule out uh, varices. So this is a, a picture which is showing portal pressure, which is also equals to hepatic vein pressure gradient, HVPG. So HVPG is basically is a uh, is wedge hepatic venous pressure minus three hepatic venous pressure. And the value is around four millimeters of mercury, which is normal. And more than five millimeters of mercury is labeled as portal hypertension. So this uh, chart is very important, especially for the postgraduate because they come across with clinical scenarios and BCQs relating to the portal hypertension and their complications. So the normal uh, measurement of portal pressure, HVPG is one to five millimeters of mercury. 
six to ten millimeters of mercury is preclinical sinusoidal portal hypertension. More than or equals to ten millimeters of mercury is clinically significant portal hypertension. More than twelve millimeters of mercury is increased risk of rupture of varices with this pressure. And with more than sixteen millimeters of mercury, there is increased risk of mortality. And with more than or equals to twenty millimeters of mercury, uh, there is a risk of treatment failure and also increased mortality in acute varicose bleeding setting. So uh, this is the graph showing the target reduction in portal pressure improved prognosis in patient with liver cirrhosis. So you can well appreciate from this graph. That a reduction in portal pressure leads to improvement in the varicose bleeding, improvement in the ascites, and the overall survival. Screening endoscopy. So, according to Bavino guidelines, screening endoscopy is recommended in all patients with cirrhosis to assess for the presence of varices. So, can we select cirrhotic patient in need for endoscopy? Or try. There are some. Uh, what are some endoscopy non-invasive do, tools to try patients for endoscopy? So there are certain non-invasive markers uh, to predict varices, uh, which are uh, platelet count or platelet count to screen diameter ratio, but they do not re reliably predict the presence of esophageal varices. In contrast, studies have shown that transient elastography, which is currently available freely in, in private and government sectors, can accurately predict the presence of varices. So uh, this was a study which uh, which we uh, published back in 2008, correlation of thrombocytopenia with varying of esophageal varices in chronic liver disease patients. And in this study, uh, we had concluded that the severity of thrombocytopenia increased as the grading of esophageal varices increased. And the thrombocytokine uh, count was significantly and inversely correlated with the grade of esophageal varices. Uh, TE and screening for EGD. The AGA recommends that in individuals with suspected compensated cirrhosis who undergo testing with vibration control elastography, a value of 19.5 kilopascal or greater indicates a need for EGD to identify high-risk esophageal varices. And ASLD also recommends using a transient elastography value of greater than 20 kPa as a strong indicator for the presence of clinically significant portal hypertension. So uh, this is a cartoon showing cirrhotic liver without esophageal varices. Sometimes in the compensated cirrhosis and, cirrhot, uh, and in uh, cirrhosis, uh, when you do go for uh, screening endoscopy, there is no esophageal varices. This is the endoscopic view. And this is the cartoon showing cirrhotic liver. You can well appreciate in this uh, cartoon. This is the cirrhotic liver with large esophageal varices. This is the endoscopic view. This is a, a natural endoscopic view of which is showing small esophageal varices. These are the white arrows which are showing small esophageal varices uh, in endoscopy. Uh, this is the endoscopic view showing red whale marks. And this is very important that you have to mention about the red whale mark sign in your endoscopy report. If you are uh, doing screening endoscopy or you are doing emergency endoscopies, because these are the sign of impending rupture of esophageal varices. So it's very important to label, uh, to mention uh, them in your uh, reports. So this is the endoscopy uh, report uh, picture showing large esophageal varices. GOV2 and IgV1 varices are in the fundus of the stomach, and these are called gastric varices. Basically, there are three types of gastric varices, GOV1, GOV2, and IgV1. But GOV1 is usually treated as esophageal varics, and GOV2 and IgV1 is treated as fundal varices. So um, around 10 to 15% of varicell bleeding occurs to the fundal varices. Fundal bleeding, variceal bleeding is usually severe and more difficult to control. 
varices are also found in other areas of the stomach. They are called IgV2. They can present in um, duodenum and rectum as well, and they are called as uh, ectopic varices. So follow up EGD in patients with cirrhosis. If, so if EGD is performed in a patient with compensated cirrhosis and you find no varices, so follow up EGD should be performed in two to three years. The two year interval is recommended in persons who have ongoing liver injury. This is very important or associated comorbidities such as obesity or alcohol use. And the three year interval is considered appropriate when the liver injury is considered quiescent such as following viral elimination or abstinence from alcohol. So this is the graph showing risk of first variceal hemorrhage determined by child class, variceal size and the presence of red well marks on the varices. And you can well appreciate that large varices with red well marks and child to see is a high risk for impending rupture or very first variceal hemorrhage. So how we will prevent uh, first bleeding or first hemorrhage? So we have two options, non-selective beta blockers, which includes nadolol, propanolol, carbidolol, and endoscopic variceal ligation. So uh, risk of variceal bleeding in patient with cirrhosis. So in 2%, no, in, in no cases of no varices, there's 2% risk of uh, uh, variceal bleeding in a one year period. 5% with small varices and 15% with the large varices. Non-selective beta blockers prevent first variceal bleeding in both compensated and decompensated patients. So with these graph, you can appreciate that with the use of non-selective beta blockers, there is um, improvement in the portal pressure and also there is decrease in the first year um, decrease uh, risk of bleeding in the two years as compared to the placebo. So beta blocker in patients with small varices. So the yellow one is the placebo. Uh, green one is the nadolol, the non-selective beta blocker. So the cumulative risk of bleeding was reduced by 50% with nadolol. And this is not confirmed by another study. Beta blockers recommended in high risk patients with endoscopic red signs or child C. Nidolol is not available in Pakistan, but the other non selective beta blockers are available in Pakistan. So, beta blockers in patients with medium to large varices, and you can appreciate in these graphs, there's marked uh, decrease in the uh, bleeding episodes with the uh, use of non-selective beta blockers in medium and large size varices. So this is the picture, endoscopic view, uh, showing uh, variceal band ligation. These are the rubber bands ligated at the base of the varices. So um, I had done this study in which I evaluated the esophageal variceal band ligation interval and number required for the obliteration of varices. This was a multi-center study. So this is a common question. How many times we go for the uh, band ligation in a patient for the complete obliteration of the esophageal varices and which interval is suitable for our patient? Most of the studies and guidelines are taken from the foreign um, patients and uh, uh, other countries. So this is the first study from Pakistan. So. Uh, we concluded that as esophageal variceal ligation was a safe and well-tolerated procedure performed at three-week interval in patients with large esophageal varices, and, and on average, two or three sessions of EV beer are required for the complete obliteration of esophageal varices. And in this study, we come across very few complications like post-banding, uh, post-banding bleeding and sepsis. There are only few cases. So it's a very safe procedure if we perform at three week interval till complete obliteration of the esophageal varices. So uh, varicell band ligation is associated with lower mortality than placebo and non-selective beta blockers have lower mortality than EVA. So uh, you can appreciate from the result 
that uh, non uh, very cell band ligation and non selective beta blocker both reduces the mortality and uh, non selective beta blockers has more uh, favorable effect on the mortality as well this is a very important chart especially for the post graduate student as we uh, this, this talk is in post graduate uh, course so what are the recommended beta blocker doses for primary prophylaxis against varicell bleeding so carvedilol the dose is 6.25 mg once daily and i i want to mention one thing that uh, i come across many prescriptions from physicians and from gastroenterologists they usually advise 6.25 mg half dd so uh, the exact dosage and the way of administering carvedilol is a once daily dosage and use and um, and uh, in the morning it has a good efficacy dose titration after 3 days you can increase to 6.25 mg twice daily maximal dose is 12.5 mg per day and you, the main goal is systolic blood pressure of more than equals to 90 mm of mercury nadolol is not available in pakistan its dose starting dose is 2 to 4, 20 to 40 mg once daily and you can increase up to 2 to 3 Uh, days until treatment goal reach or at maximum dose. Maximum dose is one sixty milligram per day in patients without ascites and eighty milligram in patients with ascites. Uh, goals same: resting heart rate fifty five to sixty beats per minute and systolic pressure of more than ninety uh, uh, milligram millimeters of mercury. Propanolol uh, it's a common non selective beta blocker available uh, prescribed for portal hypertension. 20 to 40 mg twice daily is a starting dose you can increase every 2 to 3 days until treatment goal reach or at maximum dose the maximum dose is 320 mg per day in patient without ascites and 160 mg per day in patient with ascites and our goals are the same so which uh, non selective beta blocker uh, is good this question is commonly asked by my residents uh, carvedilol versus traditional propanolol or non selective beta blocker for adults uh, with cirrhosis so uh, this slide um, i have taken from uh, the cochrane database so according to the author there uh, these authors they found no clear beneficial or harmful effects of carvedilol versus traditional non selective beta blocker on mortality upper gi bleeding adverse events despite the fact that carvedilol was more effective at reducing the hbpg in study so management of patient with cirrhosis following egd screening so no zero varices you can repeat in 2 to 3 years small varices high risk of bleeding red bell marks yes you can start with non selective beta blockers no you can repeat endoscopy in 1 to 2 years Large varices, you can start with non-selective beta blockers or very endoscopic variceal ligation. So, lowest debleeding rates are obtained in HPPG responders and with ligation plus beta blocker. So, this is the chart showing very good lowest debleeding rates uh, with the combination of the therapy ligation plus beta blockers. So, gastric varices. This is a endoscopic view of gast gastric varic with a bleeding point. So primary prophylaxis of GV bleeding. So cyanoacrylate in study they have observed that cyanoacrylate decreases bleeding as compared with observation or non-selective beta blockers. And also cyanoacrylate improves mortality versus observation and uh, 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 and non-selective beta blockers. so in one of the rct glue was more effective than ligation in preventing recurrent bleeding from gastric varices so you can appreciate this thing so fundal varices can be obliterated by injecting them with cyanoacrylate by endoscopy or you can inject um, uh, with ejus uh, guided combined with coil so recurrent hemorrhage or bleeding rate is around 3% after one year
prevention of rebleeding from gastric varices. So patients who recover from GOV2, IG1, hemorrhage, pips, or burto are first line treatment in the prevention of rebleeding. Cyanoacrylate glue injection is an option for cases where the anatomy for tips of Roberto is not favorable. For primary profile excess from GOV2 or IG1 bleeding, non-selective beta bones can be used. Also, the data is not as strong as for the esophageal vases. But, but, but however, the glue is not approved by the FDA for intravascular injections and therefore its use in, in this setting is off-label in America and some other countries, but it's a common practice in Asian countries and European countries. So the uh, one of the uh, most uh, uh, hazardous side effects of this cyanoacrylate is embolization, and it is greater with the use of compounds with longer, longer polymerization time, like 8-carbon, 4-carbon mixed with lipoidal, larger amounts injected, Concomitant coil injection may reduce the risk of embolization, which is commonly practiced with EUS guided cyanoacrylate therapy. So, this is the uh, cartoon showing Berto. So, frontal vases can be obliterated by injecting them uh, with cyclorosing from the inside of the vessel, balloon occluded retrograde transvenous uh, obliteration, but uh, its, its, its expertise are not available in Pakistan. Acute bleeding in cirrhosis. So the initial management, as you all know, IVSS, you have to give the prophylactic antibiotics, vasoactive therapy. Uh, and but one very important thing for the postgraduates, because they are the first who manage the patient in emergency, do not overtransfuse. According to the Bavino, the goal of uh, the main target hemoglobin is seven to eight milligrams per deciliter. So do not over transfuse your patient with the blood. So avoid shock because it can lead to acute kidney injury. Uh, you can give IV erythromycin uh, 30 minutes before endoscopy, but IV erythromycin is not available in Pakistan. And uh, in our setting, I usually give injection metoclopramide and it has good effects. And uh, avoid the systemic, systematic and long-term use of TPIs, that is omeprazole. And uh, there's no recommend recommendation regarding to the coagulopathy, but it's a, it's a very common practice in Pakistan. We usually transfuse FFPs before uh, emergency endoscopy or in case of derangement of um, coagulation. So this is the uh, picture showing endoscopy with active frontal basal bleeding. And this is the stigmata of the bleeding. This is the uh, nipple sign. So you have to go for the endoscopy at least within the uh, first 12 hours of admission. So you can manage the bleeding. So this is a graph which is showing um, uh, flow chart for the management of varicell bleeding. So airway protection, endoscopy within 12 hours. If there is esophageal varicell bleeding, go for varicell ligation. No further bleeding. Secondary profile access would need non-selective beta blockers or EVL. If EVL failure or non-selective beta are not tolerated, you can go for the tips. And uh, in cases of re-bleeding, repeat EVL, further bleeding, you can again refer your patient for the tips or the surgeries, gastric varicell bleeding, endoscopic or EUS glue injection, um, eradication by glue injection or failure, or for secondary profile access, go for the tips. So tips for the prevention of esophageal re varicell re-bleeding. So early tips versus uh, versus conventional therapy. I would, uh, at high risk of excuse me, Dr. Nazish, I would like to request you to kindly uh, adhere to the timelines. We have crossed our time limit. Can you kindly okay. wrap up the, uh, the talk? Thank you. I think this is the, my uh, second last slide. So uh, early tips improve the survival. So only one slide for the early tips. In patient at high risk of failure or re-bleeding CTP class, uh, C cirrhosis or CTP class B with active bleeding on endoscopy who have no contraindication for tips and early or preemptive tips within 12, 72 hours may benefit selected patient. So uh, the ideal candidates are child C less than 14 uh, points with possibility of rescue liver transplantation or with potential for reversibility, that's with alcohol. 
patients with refractory ascites and excellent heart function. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Nazis, for a very rich and informative talk. Uh, at the conclusion of the first talk, I would not only like to thank Dr. Nazis, but also our esteemed uh, panel of chairpersons, Professor Anwar Ahmed Khan, uh, Professor Sayyid Husnain Ali Shah, Professor Javed Iqbal Farooqi, and Professor Shahab Abed. Uh, we move on to our next talk, which will be titled Hepatic Encephalopathy. Hepatic encephalopathy is a spectrum of neurocognitive manifestations often seen in patients with liver injury and also seen rarely in patients who have portosystemic shunting without liver cirrhosis. Uh, this hepatic encephalopathy can be as divided into two types, overt and covert. And patients who have encephalopathy have compromised clinical outcomes, uh, markedly decreased quality of life and increased healthcare utilization which results in a heavy financial and personal burden on caregivers. The talk on hepatic encephalopathy will be given by our dear Dr. Farooq Khan. Uh, he's a consultant hepatologist in Leicester, and he's an accredited, uh, he has received his accredited training in advanced hepatology and liver transplantation, and his areas of clinical interest are decompensated liver disease and palliative hepatology. Dr. Farooq Khan. Um, thank you very much for the organizers um, giving me the opportunity to talk on hepatic encephalopathy. Um, so the remit of the talk um, is going to be how we manage encephalopathy in the palliative setting. So patients who are not transplant candidate, what can we do to help them? Um, how can we help them at home? How can we help them in hospital? How can we help them in outpatient, inpatient? All of these we are going to discuss today. So before I start, let me touch upon a bit of a pathophysiology so it makes slightly more sense. Um, right hand side of the screen, if you look at the bowels, um, this is where we eat through the bacterial translocation. We have the fermentation, if you like, and the ammonia gets generated in the blood. Major part of that ammonia goes to the liver. It then detoxifies it and it produces urea, which then either get excreted through the kidneys out, or a certain part of this then gets converted into glutamine. Muscles also do a very small amount of metabolism for ammonia and therefore also releases some glutamine, which most of it get picked up by the kidneys and excreted in the urine. This is, this is what we call the normal pathway. Now, what happens in cirrhosis? Again, from the gut, you can see that the ammonia load has increased significantly. However, we now have a scarred liver that has not got the capacity to deal with it. Okay, but well, what's going to happen next? So ammonia metabolism has now got to be diverted. Unfortunately, the next thing that comes in that is the muscle, which then starts all the oxidative stress and the metabolism. And this is one of the reasons why you see sarcopenia and malnourished patients that very early on in the decompensated phase, particularly when this starts to become encephalopathy, they start to lose weight. Hence nutrition, and I'll talk about this, why is that so important? And what happens to the metabolism? You have glutamine. Remember, glutamine is hyperosmolar, which can then go to the brain, adopted by the brain cells, which then have swelling up. A very small amount goes to the kidneys and comes out of the urea. So therefore, muscle play a very, very important role in ammonia metabolism in cirrhosis. Well, okay, so what happens in the brain? When glutamine gets picked up into the brain cells, it is metabolized by glutamine synthetase. Intracellular glutamine we know is osmotically active. And as you can see, the same cell when it gets picked up in the electron microscope, you see that it has lost the structure, it's swollen up, and the osmotically active will get. And very relevant, why, what precipitates encephalopathy? How do we know? that this is the patient presenting to us as encephalopathy can be actually prevented. And I think before we talk about prevention, I think it's important that we look at the precipitants. So brain or the astrocytes in the center um, increase ammonia levels. First thing first, it could be purely down to worsening of your liver disease. 
infection, GI bleed, and TIPS. All these are associated with increased uh, encephalopathy. Inflammation, particularly infection, we know that in the bowel, uh, bacterial translocation, constipation is one of the recognized uh, factors. Sarcopenia, protein energy, malnutrition, I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, in the brain, we know increasing the blood flow, i.e. hyponatremia, dehydration, all drives this. And lastly, in kidneys, diuretics, acute kidney injury, hyperkalemia, all these are the factors that can increase or potentiate effects of encephalopathy. So what are the different stages through that patient passes or goes as we talk about encephalopathy? So we have a minimal level of encephalopathy, then we have persistent or episodic. And I think for you and me as a clinician, this bit is the most difficult. What we don't know when this patient comes with encephalopathy is this is end or is it just something that he's going to recover? And this, I think, is very, very important to understand and talk about. Because within this, the patient can really range from class one to even best heaven grade four, come back to the normal, be normal for a few days, weeks, or months, and then have another. And this is where a lot of the time we see the problem. So the patient of yours who's not a transplant candidate, how do you manage them? You can look after them in your outpatients. When they get admitted to hospital, how do we look after them in the inpatients, in the emergency department as they just arrived for the first 24 hours of their care? And how do you look after them at home? Let's talk about the outpatient care. We all know that the first line therapy is lectulose. Well, why lectulose? I get asked this so many times um, by my trainees. And let me just quickly explain this use. This is large bowel. I think there are three mechanisms that are well established how the lectulose will affect. So first of all, um, it's a non-absorbable. It doesn't get absorbed in the stomach or small bowel, and it reaches a large bowel where it produces acetic acid, formic acid, or lactic acid. What do they do? They increase your water absorption through, and the water comes within uh, your large bowel, hence increasing soften the stool, increase in the bowel distension. One of the reasons patients feel bloated with this. What's the second mechanism? If you look, ammonia we've talked about, you now have large loads reaching your gut. If you look, what will happen, all these um, acidic active will then convert ammonia into ammonia ions, which is the um, active state of ammonia, which therefore stay within and does not get reabsorbed. This electrically activated ammonia molecule, if you like, is not reabsorbable. So therefore, ammonia stays in the bowel and goes out. And the third mechanism, which is only hypothesis at this stage, is that through the fermentation or the gut flora, the bacteria that causes the translocation, it changes the flora and therefore reduces that bacteria translocation avoiding the inflammation within the liver. And the other important thing about um, this is that you need to be very careful about the family and the carer. And I think their education is really, really vital. They need to understand how important lectulose is and how it can help. If you're, They need to understand that they, when the patient becomes encephalopathic, it can be transient. They need to give lectulans, looking to titrate the stools two to three times a day. Most of the time, when they become far too drowsy, they can even give lectulans with a five mil syringe just in the buccal cavity as the patient drowsy, and they can keep sucking. Just make sure they're propped up. The other thing that helps in this situation is um, phosphate enemas. Some people even use soap enemas. Anything that increases, softens the stools and permeability through the bowel would help. What are the second line therapies? We know rifaximin, um, safe, only the evidence is with lectulose, and this is important really. There's no point starting rifaximin if your patient is not on lectulose. There is no evidence of it. Some people have used metronidazole, however, the neurotoxicity is a problem, so I would only suggest small doses. Lola, what is it? It's a stable salt which increases 
um, muscle ammonia metabolisms. It also have proven to have a better protective effect. There's recently, a couple of years ago, meta-analysis that have proven its um, benefits, although um, the data you might have to look with a bit of a pinch of a saw, really. Zinc sulfate we can use uh, in an outpatient setting. Again, uh, its deficiency is very common in cirrhotics, um, and you can use it for up to a month two to three times a year, you can repeat that cycle. Branch in amino acids have a limited role. However, it then may increase the muscle mass, so therefore help in patients who are particularly malnourished or sarcopenic. Rifeximin, I, I said we will talk about this in a bit of a detail. Why do we use it? It's mostly its role is along with lectulose, and it's mostly used in recurrent or prevention of a second attack. When do I use it? I normally start this when my patient has got first proven episode of encephalopathy whilst they're on lecture So their first encephalopathy episode, either requiring hospital admission or even at home if they've been diagnosed. It. Um, so very decent study um, looking at hospital admissions have shown NNT, the number needed to treat for I think that's a very significant difference. And this has also shown reduced hospital admission. So I think if your patient has got first proven episode of hepatic encephalopathy on lectulose, it's very reasonable to start them under fixed I mean, either on the outpatient basis or when they go home. Hospital care, what does that mean? So when you are an ED and your patient comes, please first thing first assess hydration. It is not uncommon that these patients are on lots of diuretics. And it's the dehydration which is a known trigger for um, hepatic encephalopathy. Stop the diuretics, correct their electrolytes. IV fluids are relevant. A lot of people get concerned about normal saline. I do, I do not think it's a major issue, really. Um, if albumin is available, there's a lot of data coming now that the albumin uh, solution or infusions on mid to long term basis improves decompensated states. But I, I, I can really understand it's expensive and may not be available. Aim here is to treat the dehydration. Malnutrition, it's time and time again, uh, it, it comes to our attention that people have stopped eating or drinking a lot because this is how they have been communicated. Um, they will stop eating proteins because the, the, the old school of thought was that it, it, it exacerbates hepatic encephalopathy. And they're not just that, there are multiple factors. They get bile acid deficiencies of cholestasis, impaired glucose metabolism, because of course we know that they're running out of their glycogen reserves. And we also know that, that the liver itself is scarred and not been able to do the metabolism it's meant to do. And the if, if you look at the overnight fast in a cirrhotic patient is really, really equals to three day worth of the fast that you and I would have done in a normal working liver. So it really is a lot meaning to it. So how do I deal with the nutrition? You can start at day one, your patient gets admitted to hospital and you encourage the oral intake. If you think he is not picking up, I think it's entirely reasonable. I normally give them first 24 hours and if it's not working, my dietitian goes and visits them and we start them on NG feed. Why? There are two potential benefits. A, we can give medications through nasogastric tube and B, you could actually measure the amount of energy they're having, which is 35 to 40 kilocalories of their body weight per kilogram. And similarly, proteins 1.2 to 1.5. Uh, this is very nice. Um, slide from easel guidelines, what do they need to take uh, as a daily intake? Encourage them to have small meals. It's not uncommon that my patients have five or six meals in a day rather than one or two large meals. Um, what type of meal they should have? Encourage them to have complex carbohydrates rather than simple. But what's the difference between the simple and, and complex? So your complex carbohydrate is your brown rice, right? It's your oats, it's your wheat, um, pastas. These are your complex carbohydrates. Why are they more helpful? Because they release the energy slowly. Small portions, every two to three hours have a small bite. Um, snack before they go to bed, a couple of biscuits with a glass of milk is, 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 is fine. Um, 
and you can certainly use branched uh, amino acids to supplement or improve the muscle mass. What do I tell patients and their carers really? Because a lot of the time, if you see most of the patients and the relatives, when they come across, they would have issues with what shall we give them to eat, what shall we not? And what I've done for you, I've just summarized it in this slide, what do they need to have? Please don't restrict their proteins. They can have 1.2 to 1.5 grams per kilogram, up to two grams, to be honest, is fine. And how they can have it? They can have it in the meat. If they can't have in the meat because they can't afford it or it's not to their taste, that's fine. If the vegetarians, you can have lentils, you can have green peas, you can have chickpeas. There are a lot of food that you can help. Complex carbohydrate we've talked about and balanced diet. So what does that mean? You have to look at their dry body weight and try and correct it through. They're not the one that is with the ascites. The last slide, I wanted to talk about patients who are in persistent grade four in cathelopathy. How do you treat them? How, how do you now look at or manage these patients? Uh, slightly tricky because remember, as we said, what we do not know whether these patients have had the opportunity to deal with all the preventive measures or the precipitants that you've looked at. So you looked at the dehydration, you treated their infection, you corrected their um, electrolytes, you stopped their diuretics, you started them on lectulos, you've done what you can, you pass the NG feed, but they are not waking up. It's now 48, 72 hours, you're not really seeing the response. So I think it's not, if, if it is their second or third admission Within the last six months, if they're ACLF3, we know they're not a transplant candidate. I think it's entirely reasonable that you start to have discussion with the family that you need to really look after them rather than trying active treatment. Not every patient can die at home. There's some people may have poor social support, particularly young patients. I think it's entirely reasonable the family may not be able to cope with it. Keep them in the hospital, it's not unreasonable. Um, should we do uh, endoscopy if they have a large GI yeah, hemorrhage? Uh, the answer is no. At that stage, I would pass large bore NG, and I would just keep them comfortable. Look after their pain and agitation, and when we talk about in the other session of sim symptom control, we will talk about how do we manage pain and agitation. Okay, and um, I will finish um, here, and we will take questions at the end of the session. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Farooq. Uh, I think uh, uh, speakers such as you and topics such as these, uh, such speakers deserve the title of Mythbusters for busting very old set traditions that are not actually practical and uh, do not hold ground uh, uh, in the current scenarios as evidenced, uh, as you have yourself have outlined. Now we have a list of questions um, from all uh, from our audience um, and we have selected uh, the most pertinent questions for you uh, for you and Adnan, Dr. you Nas need to unmute your mic Adnan you need to unmute your mic can everybody hear me Uh, I hope I'm audible to the audience now. Uh, thank yeah. you very much, Dr. Dr. Farooq. Uh, that's a fantastic talk, and uh, uh, speakers such as you uh, should be given the title of a mythbuster for uh, busting uh, long-held myths about management of uh, conditions such as hepatic encephalopathy, uh, which really do not hold ground in the current scenarios as evidenced by studies and practical evidence in the, on the field. Now, we have selected uh, a set of questions uh, from the audience, uh, and we would like to forward them to our speakers. Now, uh, first of all, I let me just scroll down. Oh. So the question is, uh, can non-selective beta blockers be used for primary prophylaxis? I would like to target, uh, uh, request Dr. Nazash Butt 
to answer this, this is, question. Uh, this question is also uh, already answered by me in the presentation. Uh, yes, uh, non-selective beta blockers, the drug of choice for the primary profile access uh, for esophageal varices, for the prevention of bleeding from esophageal varices, yes, of course. And propanolol and carbidolol is available, so you can start uh, whatever you like. It's up to you, as there is no marked difference in the results of both the non-selective beta blockers. Secondly, uh, uh, the, the, the other question was, uh, can uh, proton pump, the importance of proton pump inhibitors in variceal GI bleeding? both uh, uh, esophageal and gastric? In variceal bleeding, there is no role of proton pump inhibitors. But as you all know that in the emergency, uh, emergency when the patient presented with upper GI bleed and you don't know the diagnosis, so you can start with omeprazole. But as, as you come to know that this bleeding is due to variceal bleeding, you can, uh, you can stop PPI. So there is no need to continue uh, PPI for three days as in the ulcer bleeding. Uh, Dr. Farooq, I would like to target the next question towards you. Uh, and this is a very common situation that we see in, um, uh, in our patients. What would be the ideal sedative for a patient who is having hepatic encephalopathy and is getting extremely irritable? Now, this is a scenario that is faced very frequently by our residents on the floor in the middle of the night. Uh, you, uh, patients getting extremely irritable, getting out of their beds. And so what would be the ideal sedative for such patient in a ward environment? He is. I would like to forward the question to one of the chairpersons. Would, uh, would, would uh, Dr. Javed, uh, would uh, Professor Husnan Alisha like to take up this question? Uh, I would say... Uh, I need to show my face as well. Uh, oh, you cannot start video because the host has stopped. You have stopped we can, my we can hear, video. We can hear you, sir. Okay. Uh, I think uh, in the circumstances that we work in, short-acting benzodiazepine, uh, which is re reversible, would be the choice. Like, for instance, modabazolam or alprazolam, which have got antidotes. Uh, serenis has been used, but it's got its own problems. Serenis is haloperidol, but I would rather not recommend that um, in our uh, setting. Short-acting benzodiazepines would be the one uh, which would be okay. And we've got um, the antidotes available, and uh, the half-life is uh, uh, sort of 8 to 12 hours. Uh, so I would go for that. Thank you, sir. Uh, going on next. Uh, again, Dr. Farooq, now, the question is, as, as I understand it, the, uh, uh, the audience, the audience uh, member asks, is asking, do we need counseling for diet in patients with hepatic encephalopathy and, uh, and would it reduce the recurrence depending on the diet? I think what the, uh, the gentleman or lady who asked this wanted to ask was, there is a taboo subject in Pakistan uh, uh, as regards the amount of protein uh, the amount of meat that patients with hepatic encephalopathy and who have a history of HE can take. So uh, counseling does, you know, you, you did outline very clearly that these patients have very high energy requirements and have protein energy malnutrition as well. So uh, the diet and the, uh, the counseling that we need to do generally to these patients when we see them in our outpatient clinics, uh, what would be your thoughts on that matter? If uh, Dr. Farooq Khan isn't available, I would like to forward this question to Professor Anwar Ahmed Khan. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, sir. We can hear you clearly. Okay. Uh, I think the important thing is that uh, to determine whether the patient has repeated encephalopathy or, or one-off event of uh, hepatic encephalopathy. It's very common for the clinicians to restrict proteins and the patient is already losing muscle. The liver is not uh, manufacturing proteins. Therefore, they're already getting a uh, muscle deficiency. Therefore, it's no reason to really restrict proteins. And if they're having like repeated encephalopathy, 
like uh, Dr. Farooq Khan said, uh, then that is the time if you give protein, uh, they will uh, continue to be encephalopathic. Therefore, there's no reason to restrict proteins until the patient is having continuous encephalopathy or uh, having repeated episodes of encephalopathy. Thank you, sir. Uh, now, the next question. Now, uh, I would like to expand on, uh, on this question myself as well. Uh, the audience member has asked, uh, and I would like to uh, target this question towards uh, uh, Dr. Nazis, but do you recommend prophylactic eradication of isolated gastric viruses with no evidence of bleeding? Now, my addition to this question would be, if we were to see a patient who has presented with an upper GI bleed or who has presented with a routine outpatient uh, a follow-up endoscopy and who has esophageal viruses that uh, merit band ligation and in addition they also have gastric viruses which do not show any red signs and are small to medium sized in both of these cases uh, should we consider prophylactic eradication of these viruses in the first case because just because we have seen them and they are medium sized but no red signs and in the second case is there a chance that because we would be banding the esophageal viruses, would they result in a uh, reflex increased pressure in the gastric viruses for which we should we would need to inject them with uh, a sclerosing agent as well? Dr. Nazish? Uh, very, very good question, Adnan. And I have already uh, uh, replied, of the, uh, replied this question, but uh, again, if you are asking, so uh, for the primary prophylaxis of gastric varices, if the patient is not presented with upper GI bleeding, so there are no recommendations for the histoacral sclerotherapy in such patients with no history of upper GI bleeding and you just uh, get this fundal uh, uh, varix during screening endoscopy. But there are a lot of studies from India uh, by Sarin Group and they have done a uh, uh, histoacral sclerotherapy as a primary prophylaxis for fundal varices with good, with good results. Uh, in my practice, um, in the case of isolated gastric varices with no, no esophageal varices, if the patient has CTPC and with other complications and very large fundal varices, I have done few cases uh, of hysterical sclerotherapy as a primary uh, uh, prophylaxis for the upper GI bleeding with good results. And in case, as you mentioned, the patient with upper GI bleed and has esophageal varices with red veil marks and the large fundal varics with no mark. In such a scenario, it's better to go for the dual procedure, band ligation and hysteroacral sclerotherapy. Also, we have no studies from Pakistan regarding this uh, situation, but we have studies from India and with very good results. And in my clinical practice, I usually uh, go for both the variceal ligation and uh, hysteric echo stereotherapy in case if patients presented with upper GI bleeding. All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Nazish. Now we move on to the next question. Uh, uh, I, I'll try to, I, th I think I'll try to comprehend for the, the panelists and the speakers as to what the audience member has asked. Now, the, the wording used was do you recommend band ligation in an acute gastric variceal bleed scenario? in the absence of sclerotherapy paraphernalia. So probably in a, a, in a setting where we see, I think the, what, what the audience member wants to ask is, suppose the equipment isn't available, suppose the, the, the sclerotherapy equipment, because it's quite expensive, the injection and the injection, uh, uh, the apparatus that we need, the injector itself. Uh, suppose it isn't available in the acute setting and we see uh, a gastric fundal varix which seems to be bandable, perhaps uh, the, the endoscopist feels confident that they can suction it into uh, the cap. Would you recommend it, uh, band ligating such a gastric fundal varix if sclerotherapy equipment is not available? Uh, Dr. Nazish, your opinion on this? Uh, Adnan, in case of uh, OGV, uh, OGV1, you can go for the band ligation, but for OGV2 and IGV1, no. Uh, frankly skip, uh, speaking, I have no experience of band ligation of uh, IGV-1 and OGV-2. And I am working in Jinnah Postgraduate Medical Center. is a government hospital. And we are serving all poor needy patients. And Alhamdulillah, we are doing hysterical sclerotherapy. And it is, it is easily available here. So we have no issues. So if, if, uh, if anybody come across such scenario, so uh, I advise them to refer 
them in such in such place or in such setting where all the things are available um i i don't recommend such type of heroics in in gastric bleeding you all know it's very dangerous it's very hazardous you can uh, your patient uh, dead on the table uh, with such a type of measures like bending the fundal varix i have no experience of such bending in igv1 or ogv2 uh, maybe dr hasnan or dr altaf alam can answer this question Uh, I have no such experience. I recommend hysterectomy. Hey, uh, thank you, first, Doctor Nazish, for letting us and the audience know the importance of two two words: heroic and courageous in medicine. I think two things that we should uh, stay away from. And, and as per your recommendations, I will forward this uh, question to our chairpersons. Uh, would Doctor Shahab Abid uh, want to comment on this, sir? Any uh, any experience uh, that you might have had in such a scenario, or your comments on this? Dr. Shahab, can you hear us? If Dr. Shahab can't hear us, I, I would like to forward this question to Professor Javed Iqbal Farooqi. Uh, and I raised my hand uh, about five minutes Dr. ago. Dr. Hassan, want to answer the question? My. Uh, contention on this would be answer to question number 5 and 6 as uh, banazish had said we don't have proper data control data from our settings uh, and it for the purpose of uh, the trainees who are going to be the future torch bearers in the field it's very important to uh, get them these uh, this into their minds that they have got to follow uh proper control data to form opinion and not just go after what uh, the, uh, the personal or or, or an, an anecdotal um, uh, opinion is and i think anaza should agree because she had said already in her answer that she has not got any control data on the uh, to answer this question but just stand uh, a gut feeling that, that that's how things go So that's what I got to say. That we need data, controlled trials, randomized, um, double-blind trials to form opinions about these things. Thank you. Uh, can I make a comment on this? Yes, sir. Uh, I think uh, you know there is uh, not a large data about uh, banning the gastric varices. but uh, zahir said has published a uh, small uh, number of patients uh, in whom he had band ligated the feeding vessels to large varices based on the endoscopic ultrasound mapping if you are if you are banding the feeding vessels then you are obviously uh, reducing the blood flow to the larger vessels which may be the source of bleeding uh, nevertheless Uh, this is all what is uh, visible uh, on an endoscopic ultrasound uh, if you are dealing with uh, coiling these uh, vessels then you can do it in the larger vessels but band ligation of the smaller feeding vessels mapped on the endoscopic ultrasound has been published but this is not available in most of our settings uh, therefore band ligation of the gastric varices like dr nadish but has said uh, it can cause torrential bleeding large ulcers ulcers are always formed on the ligated varices but if they're formed on the uh, gastric varix they can torrentially bleed and the patient can succumb while en route to the bigger hospitals thank you all right could i just add one word here if possible please Yes, Doctor Nadim. I would. I think I, great I would... discussion. I a great discussion. I'm just going to add my two cents here, and that is from uh, perspective of trainees. Uh, please remember uh, that when you are treating, when you're talking about treating varices endoscopically, you may just be looking at the tip of the iceberg. 
And if you end up doing uh, banding, as Professor Anwar have already alluded to, although you may see that the beta blockers have more side effects, but the severity of the side effects post banding is could could be life threatening. So please look at it. We do not want to treat the tip of the iceberg. We would like to treat the underlying problem, and the underlying problem is portal hypertension. And the best strategy to treat that is beta blockers, and that is especially true as Dr. Nazish has already said. It's and the role is really controversial when you're talking about primary prophylaxis. Th thank you very thank much, you. Dr. Nadeem. Uh, just one quick last question for Dr. Farooq Khan. Uh, any time duration for stopping rifaximin in patients with hepatic encephalopathy? Is there a time uh, long term, perhaps six, seven months, a year down the road when a patient comes to the outpatient and they haven't had an episode? Can we consider stopping rifaximin? Um, can you hear me? Yes, sir, we can. We can hear you. Oh, great. Thank you. And uh, there is there is no uh, time, really. And personally speaking, I if I have started rifeximin, I tend not to stop it. And unless there is a very, very clear indication the patient has actually recompensated. If there are so the things that the trainees need to look out for, if the patient has not had any further recurrent encephalopathy, that is probably because you have looked after him well, which means that he has still um, the lectulose and the rifeximin is working. However, if there is still an ongoing evidence of decompensation, i.e. he's got some degree of ascites or he's still jaundiced, or he has had a GI bleed in the recent time or in the last six months, I tend not to stop rifeximin really. I would carry on. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Farooq. Now, I, I know this is a very interesting issue, uh, topic, a couple of topics, GI bleeding and encephalopathy. Uh, due to time restraints, we would like to uh, have to... All right, <laughs> I've just uh, received one final question from Dr. Masroor, which is, he would like to ask the question personally. And Dr. Masroor, I hope you're unmuted and you're able to put forward your question. I don't know whether you can hear me or not. We can hear you, Professor Masur. We can hear you. Thank you very much uh, for unmuting me. It was a very nice uh, uh, session, and I really enjoyed it. Uh, and I must congratulate all of you. Uh, I would like to know uh, about the uh, use of uh, uh, lipidal, or we can use some other oil as well in uh, while we are doing sclerotherapy in a bundle variety, because I have read that Indian uh, paper who have been using some other uh, oil like olive oil or sesame oil uh, in sclerotherapy along with histoacrid. I myself is using lapidal along with uh, histoacrid and I have never used anything else, but uh, I know it's a bit an expensive one and also the prices of the medicine has gone up just to make it more easily available to us. So is there any uh, experience from the expert about using something else apart from uh, lipoidal? So this is an open question to our chairpersons and uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Nazar. I, I want to answer. Um, there are a few studies in which they have used distilled water and in some they have used sterilized olive oil as well. Uh, but they are very... Uh, uh, their studies have very few uh, than done on very few number of patients. In our setting, uh, there is a time when there is a, a shortage of lipoidal. So we have used lip uh, distilled water for the uh, mixing of the histoacryl. And my, my friends, my few friends have tried this uh, vitamin D3 for the mixing of this uh, histoacryl and they have good results. Um, that's as much I know. Uh, I think Dr. Shahab Abid can add something on this point. But it's better to use lipoidal. Yeah, Any I concluding remarks? Uh, Shahab Abid, let's take Shahab Abid comment on this. <laughs> Dr. 
डॉक्टर नदीम आई थिंक वॉन्ट टू आंसर I think there are I think, people who still want, wanting to ask questions about encephalopathy. I'm more than happy to share my details with them, and I will answer them. I, later. I, I think that would be the best way to move forward, Dr. Farooq, because this is such a rich topic, and uh, I think the the questions would be never ending, both from the faculty and from our junior colleagues. Uh, in any case, I would like to conclude this very rewarding session. Uh, uh, thank you to Professor Altaf Alam for. Uh, being a facilitator for this session, as you will be for the ongoing, uh, the entire program. Uh, and the, our two brilliant speakers, Dr. Nazish and Dr. Farooq. And Dr. Farooq, I believe you will be having another talk in the current session. We will take yes, a five-minute break. So. We will take a five-minute break now uh, to give a message from one of our sponsors. And after that break, we shall be moving on to the next set of lectures. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we can move on to the next pair of talks. The first will be on uncomplicated ascites. Uh, uncomplicated ascites is defined as one that is not infected and which is not associated with the development of hepatorenal syndrome. This, uh, ascites is the most common complication to chronic liver failure. Uh, the formation of ascites in patients with liver cirrhosis is caused by a complex chain of pathophysiological events involving portal hypertension and progressive vascular dysfunction. And since ascites formation represents a hallmark in the natural history of chronic liver failure, it predicts a very poor outcome with 50% mortality uh, within three years. Uh, this talk, uh, the talk on un uncomplicated ascites shall be given by Dr. Om Prakash. Dr. Om Prakash is a senior instructor of gastroenterology and medicine at the Aga Khan University Hospital, Pakistan. And I would request Dr. Om Prakash to kindly uh, begin his talk. Uh, Okay, so can you hear me? Yes, sir, we can hear you clearly. Thank you. So uh, let me share my slide. Now, the next talk uh, is uh, titled Refractory Ascites Acute Kidney Injury Hepatorenal Syndrome. Uh, liver cirrhosis accounts for a marked alteration in the splanking and systemic hemodynamics, which causes hypovolemia and arterial hypotension. The consequence of this activation uh, is, uh, is activation of the renin angiotensin and sympathetic systems and increased renal sodium reabsorption uh, during the course of the disease. Patients who have liver cirrhosis uh, with uh, uh, re activation of uh, the, re the system have poor prognosis and they are at a risk of developing serious complications. Patients with cirrhosis are more uh, prone to developing acute kidney injury than the non-cirrhotic population. And, uh, uh, and pre renal acute kidney injury, hepatorenal syndrome of acute kidney injury, which was formerly known as type 1 hepatorenal syndrome, and acute tubular necrosis. These two entities represent the most common causes of acute kidney injury in patients with liver cirrhosis. And it is very important to differentiate them because management is different. The talk on uh, refractory ascites, acute kidney injury, and hepatorenal syndrome shall be delivered by Dr. Shanail Kadir, who is currently working as a gastroenterologist and hepatologist at the Liaquat National Hospital and uh, Medical College in Karachi, Pakistan. Dr. Shanil. Good morning, everybody. Uh, actually, it's uh, good, uh, good evening. My name is uh, Dr. Shanil Kadir. I'm one of the gastroenterologists at Liaquat National Hospital. Thank you uh, to the PSH for uh, giving me an opportunity to talk about uh, this important topic. Uh, which is refractory, refractory ascites, AKI, and HRS. So we'll just go through uh, some of the stuff about uh, refractory ascites, AKI, in the next 25 minutes. I have no disclosures. Just to highlight the importance of management of complication of liver disease, we know um, all these complications, uh, they can happen individually or they can happen um, in conjunction with each other as well. So important thing is to recognize them and uh, to treat them. The clinical uh, course of cirrhosis from compensated cirrhosis to decompensated cirrhosis occurs at the rate of 5 to 7 percent a year. Uh, obviously, the decompensated cirrhosis is a systematic disease with multi-organ dysfunction. And what I'm going to talk to you today about is this end stage part, which is late decompensation leading to refractory ascites. Uh, jaundice and uh, other organ dysfunctions, including uh, renal dysfunction. 
from chronic liver disease to compensative cirrhosis in survival, as we know, is more than 12 years. Uh, and once patients reach decompensated cirrhosis, the median survival drops down to around two years. When we talk about decompensated cirrhosis, we talk about vi variceal hemorrhages, ascites, and, and capillopathy. And this is how, uh, I'm sure all of you already know this, but this is how the pathway works. So you got cirrhosis, portal hypertension, then bacterial translocation, and splenic vasodilatation. And after that, uh, it's always, it's all downward course. So reduce arterial blood volume, activation of vasoconstrictive uh, systems, and then renal hypoperfusion, which causes hepatorenal syndrome and ascites. And then there's this immune dysfunction as well, uh, which also causes, has an effect on hepatorenal syndrome. So the management of decompensated cirrhosis is uh, to improve the outcome of complications. So we know when uh, people get decompensated cirrhosis, these are all the complications they can have. So uh, the aim is to try and manage them. Coming to our topic, which is refractory ascites. So we know that ascites occurs at a rate of 7 to 10 percent annually in cirrhotic patients. 70 percent who develop ascites within uh, will will develop ascites within 10 years of diagnosis of cirrhosis, and of those, up to 11 percent uh, develop refractory ascites. The mortality, unfortunately, at one year is about 40 percent. Some studies say 15 to 20 percent as well and at five years more than 50 percent but it has a significant impact on patients quality of life uh, quality of life at least to frequent hospitalization <clears throat> especially uh, recurrent ascites or refractory ascites um, and ascites can be uncomplicated and refractory i'm sure uh, one of my colleagues had has already discussed about uncomplicated ascites so i'm going to talk about refractory ascites uh, this is just to go through the definitions, which I'm sure all you all know about. So mild societies, moderate societies, and gross societies. Now, whenever we talk about societies, just to uh, uh, keep on our mind uh, the basic things that we need to do, so which is salt, low salt diet, fluid restriction, make sure patients are on diuretics, and uh, use combination of diuretics if one is not working. And then uh, this is the point where you know they get refractory societies, and then we talk about paracentesis and tips. So what is refractory ascites? So at ascites which cannot be mobilized or early recurrence which cannot be satisfactorily prevented by medical therapy. So people uh, who uh, come in with recurrent uh, uh, ascites which is unresponsive uh, to medical therapy or uh, they get ascites which resolves and then occurs uh, again early within four weeks. So that's called refractory ascites. So it's divided into two bits. So diuretic resistant which is lack of response to sodium restriction and diuretic treatment, and diuretic intractable, which is uh, development of diuretic-induced complications. So that means hyponatremia, fluid imbalances, uh, hypokalemia or hyperkalemia, things like that. So the initial management of ascites we all know is maximal diuretic therapy. Make sure they are on sodium restriction. Uh, which is up to uh, two grams a day and obviously it's associated with uh, poor prognosis. Uh, this was uh, one of the few early studies which showed that combination of spironolactone and prismide uh, is better than uh, giving them uh, alone. So the diagnostic criteria for refractive ascites is that the patient must be on intensive diuretic therapy for at least one week and on salt restrictive diet. Um, the, there should be a lack of response, which is a uh, mean loss of weight of less than 0.8 kilograms over the past, over four days and urine sodium output less than the sodium intake. And early recurrence, as I mentioned er uh, earlier, was a recurrence of grade 2 or grade 3 ascites within four weeks of initial treatment. Obviously, diuretic-induced complications we all know are hepatocan capillopathy, renal impairment, hypo or hyper, hyponatremia, hypo, hyperkalemia, um, or muscle cramps. The three uh, big uh, societies uh, which uh, give us all the guidelines, um, they characterize, define, uh, they define refractory societies more or less similarly, um, and uh, you can see. Uh, in all three of these guidelines, uh, patients should be on a maximum diuretic therapy. They should be on a salt, low salt diet, and they have a lack of response, and, and then they can be characterized as refractory ascites. 
for coming to the management. So repeated large volume paracentesis along with uh, albumin, uh, which is sort of eight gram a day. Uh, people, patients who are not uh, excreting more than 30 millimoles of uh, sodium and urine, uh, you could uh, think about stopping diuretics because it's not going to work. Uh, there there should be a cautious use of beta blockers. In fact, some of the studies say that you should stop the beta blockers completely. And I'm sure we, we all know to avoid non-steroidal CS inhibitors and ARBs, uh, which affect uh, the kidneys. The important one of the important things is that these patients should be evaluated for liver transplant. So, if they are uh, fit for liver transplant or if they are considered uh, good enough for liver transplant, they, they should be directed towards that route. If, if we feel that uh, they are not fit enough for liver, tra liver transplant or at present they are not and maybe in the future they might be, then the other option would be TIPS. Now, uh, TIPS requires close clinical follow-up and uh, uh, continuation of diuretics and salt restriction until ascites resolution. Uh, it has its own side effects. So one of the biggest side effects is uh, hepatic encephalopathy, which can sometimes be uh, reduced by using small diameter uh, PTFP covered stents. However, as we know, TIPS can be used as a bridge to transplant or can be used just on its own as palliative therapy. This is a uh, study just to highlight about uh, the window hypothesis of beta blockers. So uh, if you look in the middle, this is where we start people on beta blockers with primary or secondary prophylaxis. And when they come to this stage, which is what I'm, I'm talking about, then we should uh, stop beta blockers uh, uh, so, to, so as to minimize uh, complications from it. Another uh, good study which was published in 2012 about uh, importance of album infusion in patients undergoing large volume paracentesis, and I think there is no uh, uh, there is no second uh, uh, thought or second opinion about it. Uh, this does uh, indicate that albumin reduces mortality and mor uh, and morbidity in patients with tense societies uh, compared with alternative treatment. And I'm sure most uh, uh, most of us would give albumin when uh, sending patients for acidic tab. However, <clears throat> easel guidelines do suggest that if you're doing large volume paracentesis, which is more than five liters, then you should consider albumin. Less than five liters, you're okay without uh, giving albumin. But look at the patient and uh, you can tailor the uh, guidelines according to the patients. So in conclusion, uh, refractive ascites, uh, either you can go to this path, which is intermittent uh, large volume paracentesis, or if there is uh, procedural, if there is no procedural contraindication and there is no contraindication for tips, so you can go uh, consider towards tips after discussing with your regional center or uh, or uh, liver transplant center. And why do we go for early tips? So this uh, French trial in 2016 uh, they assessed the efficacy of covered tips on transplant-free survival in patients with recurrent ascites. Um, and then they found that people who had early tips uh, fared better than people uh, who were on uh, large volume paracentesis. I am sure you all know about the indications and contraindications of tip insertion. So just to recap, absolute contraindication, child view of more than 12, married of more than 18, obviously heart failure, pulmonary hypertension, untreated infection, sepsis, indication or tips. Uh, so patients requiring more than two paracentesis a month, re refractory ascites, uh, loculated ascites. Um, so you need to think about patient sele selection as well um, and make sure that they don't have any sepsis. So. What does TIPS do? So if we look at this chart, so it reduce, it increases the preload, increasing the stroke volume, increasing the central blood volume, and then activating or activation of sodium retaining and vasoconstrictive symptoms, thereby reducing the ascites. Um, it also reduces the splenic arterial vasodilatation, and that helps with the esophageal viruses. Uh, however, because it does increase photosystemic shunting and uh, hence it can cause increased risk of hepatic encephalopathy. But in the long term, uh, TIPS is more cost effective than uh, large volume paracentesis. So this is an American study showing that in the long term, uh, TIPS might be more cost effective.
think about palliation as well. So, you know, there will be patients who are unfit for liver transplant, unfit for tips. So what do we do about them? So we need to think about palliative long-term drains in refractory ascites due to end-stage liver disease. This is a good uh, article on it. And then there are some tunneled peritoneal uh, drainage catheters which can be used in these patients. <clears throat> and also we can use uh, alpha pump. So alpha pump activates uh, if there's ascites present and it pumps it into the bladder. Um, during each uh, cycle of uh, uh, pump. So uh, it is helpful in patients as a palliative measure and measure in patients who are unfit for liver transplant or tips. Compared to standard of care, uh, this is a study which uh, shows that compared to the standard of care, the alpha pump, uh, uh, patients with alpha pump obviously require less uh, amount of uh, um, uh, as, uh, acidic uh, drainage uh, rather than people who uh, were on only a large volume alpha, a large volume uh, paracentesis. Obviously, alpha pump and tips, uh, they both have their um, side effects. So this is a very small study, uh, only 19 patients with tips, uh, but it showed that they had increased risk of hepatic and capillopathy. Uh, and again, if you look at the alpha pump arm, which was only 40 patients, uh, it was associated with increased infection rate and renal dysfunction. One thing to note is that the baseline mild was low in the tips patients. So these are all patients who presumably were fit enough for, to undergo tips. And then if you look at the alpha pump patients, the baseline mild was uh, higher. So uh, there conclusion was that although both are better but tips has a better one year transplant free survival and negative um, uh, and less negative prognostic factor as baseline so that finishes the uh, refractive society so we're just going to uh, talk about aki and hrs in uh, cirrhosis so this slide is uh, not to confuse you it's just to give you an idea about the number of mechanisms involved in AKI in cirrhotic patients. So we've just uh, simplified it here. Uh, so you have advanced cirrhosis, portal hypertension, then you get all these vasodilator mediators causing splenic artery vasodilatation, which we discussed earlier on. And then it obviously uh, reduces the arterial, it causes uh, arterial hypovolemia and then renal constriction and then you get uh, uh, renal auto, impaired renal autoregulation and then renal tissue injury and AKI and hepatorenal syndrome. So any mild increase in creatinine in, 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 the, in patients with cirrhosis could indicate a marked reduction in EGFR, so don't ignore it. Uh, we need to establish whether it's CKD or AKI or overlap. So the way to establish would be, I will be explaining it later on, but make sure that uh, you know, you're looking at uh, the blood results of the patients, um, uh, which were done in the past as well, if you have access to them. The diagnosis of CKD should be based on an EGFR of less than 60, uh, with or without any signs of renal parenchymal damage for at least past three months. Obviously, it's difficult if the patient uh, has first presentation and has never had any blood tests in the past. Uh, but ideally, most of these cirrhotic patients are under regular follow-up and they would have some sort of uh, bloods and kidney functions to look at. The diagnosis and stages of AKI should be based on adopted KDIGO criteria, which is this one. So uh, definition of AKI is increase in serum creatinine of more than 50% within uh, seven days or increase in serum creatinine of more than 0.3 milligram per deciliter within two days. There is an adaptation from International uh, Ascetic Club as well, which says that increase in serum creatinine of more than 50% in three months is also characterized as AKI. Coming to uh, CKD, we've already mentioned, you know, EGFR less than 60 for more than three months uh, with or without kidney damage. What about AKD? So acute kidney disease and again, uh, EGFR of less than 60, uh, 60 for less than three months or reduced in uh, EGFR of more than 35% for less than three months with uh, kidney damage, which is lasting for less than three months. So these are the definitions for AKI, AKD, and CKD, which is very important in patients with cirrhosis uh, because obviously you don't want to uh, miss a patient saying that 
they have CKD uh, while in fact they had acute uh, injury. What does the ICA uh, definition tell us uh, for AKI and cirrhosis? So, as I said earlier on, baseline serum creatinine. Uh, so is a creatinine which is obtained within three months prior to admission. Obviously, if there is no previous serum creatinine, then the serum creatinine on our admission should be used. Um, they define uh, AKI as increase in serum creatinine of uh, more than 0.3 milligram per deciliter within 48 hours or increase of serum creatinine of more than 50% uh, within the prior seven days, which is actually basically uh, the same as uh, these guidelines. Coming to the staging of AKI, so AKI can be stage stage one, stage two, and stage three. So stage one uh, is increase in serum creatinine of more than 0.3 milligram, uh, or increase in serum creatinine of 1.5 to two folds. And stage one can be uh, further divided into 1A, which is serum creatinine less than 1.5, and serum creatinine more than 1.5. And then stage two is increase in serum creatinine of more than two to three folds. Um, or, and stage three is more than three folds. Um, progression of AKI is what we say that when patients go on to need uh, renal replacement therapy, um, and then response to treatment, if there is no regression of AKI, that means they are uh, non-responsive. If there is full response and return of serum creatinine to baseline, then that means they are fully responsive. <clears throat> so in cirrhotic patients, all type of AKIs can happen. Uh, it's important to differentiate whether it's pre-renal, HRS, intrinsic, and particularly ATN and post-renal. The most important point is to differentiate whether it's HRS AKI or whether it's acute tubular necrosis. And uh, what, when we talk about HRS AKI, what uh, classification uh, that we use is ICA classification, which is type 1 HR, uh, HRS, which is now HRS AKI, and type 2 HRS. Uh, which includes renal impairment, which fulfills the criteria of HRS, but not of AKI. So type 1 AKI is what we are uh, mostly dealing with, which is HRS AKI. And how do we define it? So this is the definition uh, and criteria for HRS AKI. Uh, so they should be cirrhotic with ascites, you know, diagnosis of AKI according to the AKI criteria, which we discussed earlier no response to two consecutive days of diuretic withdrawal and plasma volume expansion with albumin. Absence of shock, you know, uh, make sure they are not on any nephrotoxic medications and obviously uh, do a urine dipstick or a urine DR to make sure there is absence of protein urea, uh, microhematuria, and there is normal finding of your renal ultrasound. So you're basically trying to rule out uh, all the other uh, you know, structural and uh, ATM causes of uh, kidney injury. And if they have all that, they are uh, U-volumic, and then you can make a diagnosis of HRS AKI. And how do we treat it? So first line, as we all know, is terlipressin plus albumin. Okay, so all patients uh, meeting the definition should be treated with vasocons uh, with uh, vasoconstrictors and albumin. Generally, pressing can be administered either in boluses, you know, one milligram every six hourly, or by continuous infusion. In fact, there was a recent study which showed that if you infuse them continuously, uh, the risk and the side effect profile is much uh, lower. Um, in case of non-responsive uh, patients, uh, that is after two days, if there is no uh, reduce in serum creatinine less than 25% from the peak value, then you can increase dose of terlipressin to uh, two milligram uh, four times a day um, to a maximum of 15 milligram a day. So albumin, as I said, should be used uh, in these patients. Uh, it's better to keep them in HTU setting to keep monitoring CVP volume uh, to make sure they're not uh, going into circulatory overdose. Uh, you know, in some stu uh, some studies, they've used uh, noradrenaline if they, do if they don't have terlipressin. And obviously, if you don't have terlipressin or noradrenaline, then other thing you can use, use is midotrin and octreotide. And important uh, point is monitoring of adverse side effects. Uh, I had a patient who was on terlipressin and after... Uh, a couple of days, he showed me on my ward on uh, that, uh, doctor, my uh, fingers are getting blue. I'm not sure whether it's 
because I'm in hospital or whether it's something else. And then we immediately stopped telepressing and after 24 hours, you know, they all settled down. So make sure you look for adverse side effects. The confirmed study, uh, which was recently presented at, as Azult, also shows that telepressin is effective in improving the renal function and achieving HRS reversal in patients with HRS1 and progressive advanced liver disease. So uh, there's no question about telepressin or albumin in HRS1. Now, just to recap a bit of <clears throat> basic stuff. So uh, obviously, we know early identification we are treating, uh, uh, assessing and treating patient, these patients for uh, infection. We are making sure that uh, they are not uh, presenting with GI bleed. Uh, we try to avoid large volume paracentesis so that they don't get hypovolemia and uh, hypotension. Uh, we make sure we stop beta blockers, stop nephrotoxic medications, and then we give volume expansion uh, expansers as we uh, talked about earlier on. So stage one and stage two and three AKI. So most of this stuff is the basic stuff, as we mentioned, withdrawal of diuretics, withdrawal of any other drugs. Uh, and if they respond, uh, uh, then yes, that's okay. Then you can keep uh, following them up closely. That means uh, they don't have HRS. If they don't respond, then we look for whether within they need the, they meet the criteria for HRS AKI, which was you know absence of any any kidney disease and uh, a U volumic status and uh, a normal renal uh, parenchyma, a normal renal ultrasound, and then you think about giving them with the constrictors and albumin. So what about uh, tips and liver transplant in, the, in these patients? So most patients with HRS AKI, uh, the, uh, they are contraindicated for tips because of the severe liver uh, degree of liver failure. Uh, so there is insufficient data to advocate tips in these patients. Uh, it could be suggested in patients who have uh, HRS but non-AKI, non-acute uh, kidney injury. However, the best uh, therapeutic option for these patients is liver transplant. And uh, the decision, obviously, to initiate renal transplant therapy, the renal replacement therapy should be based on individual patients and the severity of illness. So it's uh, good to get these patients in, uh, uh, seen by the renal physician. And obviously, these patients are already in an HDU setting, so you'll have intensive care input and the renal input as well. So patients who... Uh, the treatment, uh, treatment response to AKI affects post-liver transplant outcomes according to this study. It does. You no know, patients who responded to telepressin and albumin, uh, it was an independent predictor for CKD at one, uh, one year post-liver transplant. So you can uh, see that and then non-responders get worse. And just uh, one slide about, uh, you know, uh, coagulative factors in uh, patients with uh, AKI. So decompensative cirrhosis with AKI, may, uh, as you know, it causes, uh, it can cause either hypo or hypercoagulability. So uh, make sure you're looking for that in these patients as well. Take home points. So make sure you recognize this uh, early and initiate treatment. There should always, always, always be MDT involvement. So get your renal team involved, get your intensive care doctors involved, uh, get your, if you're the hepatologist, so if you're not the hepatologist, get your hepatology team, liver transplant team involved if you have any uh, around, uh, or, or speak to the liver transplant, central liver transplant, local liver transplant center. Think about tips and liver transplant in these patients. Be realistic with outcomes. You know, uh, we are treating the patient and not the numbers. Uh, some patients, as we said, uh, may not be fit for anything, and all they would need is just some palliative care. Uh, and a good uh, discussion and empathy. Uh, don't forget palliation and uh, don't forget albumin in SPP in SPP prophylaxis because obviously uh, that uh, is one of the factors. Thank you very much, Dr. Chanel, for the excellent and very rich talk. Uh, I hope uh, the, our IT team has been able to successfully iron out any issues that uh, we were facing earlier with Dr. Om Prakash's talk. Just to refresh our audience, um, uh, Dr. Om Prakash, uh, who is an associate professor of gastroenterology in the uh, at the Aga Khan University Hospital, Pakistan, is due to deliver a talk on uncomplicated ascites. 
Uh, as we all know, ascites is the most common complication to patients with advanced liver failure. Uh, the formation of ascites in the cirrhotic patient is caused by a complex chain of pathophysiological events involving portal hypertension and progressive vascular dysfunction. Since society's formation represents a hallmark in the natural history of chronic liver failure, it predicts a poor outcome with a 50% mortality rate within, 50, uh, within the, uh, three years. Uncomplicated ascites is defined as one which is not infected and which is not associated with the development of a pararenal syndrome. So the audience can now have an idea that we are uh, comprehensively covering ascites uh, with Dr. Om Prakash and Dr. Shanil Khadar's talks. As previously, uh, the facilitator for this meeting will be Professor Altaf Alam and our uh, eminent uh, chair of panelists from the previous session will be continuing as well. Uh, Dr. Om Prakash, uh, you may start your talk. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, sir, we can hear you clearly. Thank you. Uh, so, just oh, my camera. Can you see me as well? Uh, no, sir, we see your slide. Okay. So anyway, so let's just yes, start. Yes, we, we uh, see you now, sir. We see you. So thank you so much, uh, and and very well done, the organizer and the PA Pakistan Society of Hepatology, as they have done uh, the very wonderful job in doing the first ever virtual conference. And as you know, that this year is a very unique year for everyone, and it's given an opportunity to adopt to the new norm. And that. In that case, I, I must say congratulations to Dr. Zishan and Dr. Farooq and the team. They have done a wonderful job. So uh, as you know, the Dr. Shanil has uh, done a great job in taking much of the... Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, sir. We can hear you clearly. Thank you. Uh, so just oh, my camera. Okay. Can you see me as well? Uh, no, sir. We see your slide. Okay. So anyway, so let's just start. Yes, we, uh, we see you now, sir. We see you. So thank you so much. Uh, and, and very well done, the organizer and the PA Pakistan Society of Hepatology, as they have done uh, the very wonderful job in doing the first ever virtual conference. And as you know, that this year is a very unique year for everyone. And it's given an opportunity to adopt to the new norm and that in that case, I, I must say congratulations to Dr. Zishan and Dr. Farooq and the team. They have done a wonderful job. So uh, as you know, the Dr. Shanil has uh, done a great job in taking much of the time and has almost covered every aspect of the site. So he has made my life very easy. So without um, undue delay. So the topic of my uh, talk was given to me was uncomplicated ascites. And I was told that you should share some cases and, and that there should be some discussion on that. So disclosure, none. So objective uh, of my talk would be to able to understand the management of the CITES based on the cases, different uh, couple of cases I will share with you and then will be the literature they support and able to define the refractory CITES and able to understand the paracentesis induced circulatory dysfunction, which was not covered by the channel. As I was supposed to be the first speaker, so uh, I was, uh, I plan to, you know, just give the brief outline of how the CITES mechanism is. So the slides are there, but uh, Shanil has already given us a, a great background about the CITES. So ascites, as you know, this is a Greek word, uh, which comes from the word eskos, uh, means bag or sack. So ascites describes the condition, uh, which it means it's a pathological accumulation of the uh, fluid in the peritoneal cavity. There is a, some minimal amount of fluid in the, that is normally, but if it is an abnormal, then it, it's in, called as an ascites. And so, uh, as, so we have been discussing for the last two couple of hours about the portal hypertension and its complications. So this is the third complication that we are discussing. We have covered the encephalopathy, we have covered the upper GI bleed, now we are covering the CITES. So traditionally we were taught in our student life or in school, medical schools that there are two theories which are responsible for the development of the CITES, the underfill and overflow theory. Now it is overruled by the, the latest uh, development of the vasodilatation theory, which is well recognized. So moving on now to the cases. Uh, so this is a case that we saw last week is one of my patients. It's a 58 year old lady recently diagnosed with a CVCLD. 
uh, who was referred to us by a GP who first time uh, saw that lady and put her on the diuretics and referred to us for further management. So, and she comes to us within a week time and she reported that there's no improvement in the symptoms. So I'm put, uh, putting some questions. So do we need to do the large volume paracentesis? And do we just ask her to follow the strict uh, salt restriction? Are we increase the dose of furosemide and spironolactone? Or we do the combination of these things? So as uh, we are not taking the live questions, so I will be moving further because otherwise we can discuss on each of these questions and everything is correct for this scenario, but depends upon where you are practicing and how are you comfortable in managing this case. So, and again, uh, so if, since you, you as a hepatologist in tertiary care, sit, uh, tertiary care hospital sitting there, what further information you need this? Because that lady come with just uh, the diuretics and some score. So obviously you need to have a, because this is a first encounter. So you need to have a child or code P score of like complete uh, prog for prognostication purpose. You need further workup. So, and obviously this lady has come to you, then you need to, as a Shanil uh, described you, the, the cytic tip is essential. So will you do the cytic tip in this patient? If yes, then why? What additional workup you need for this patient? What further test you can do on the ascytic fluid if you are if you are to do the cytic tap? So the tests that are ordered on samples of cytic fluid are determined by the clinical settings in which practice you are working, right? So two of the main issues that arise regarding the ascites are especially particularly true for Pakistani setup that you always need to rule out whether this fluid is infected or not. There are two main reasons. Number one, whether this is an SBP or some other infections like tuberculosis, which is very much common. And then you need to do the sub on the cytic fluid analysis. That will determine whether this fluid is related to the CLD or some other reasons. So the abdominal paracentesis is central to determining the cause of ascites and in ruling out or confirming the SBP. In patients with SBP, as a moderator uh, described, that is associated with significant mobility and mortality. So mortality increases by 3.3% per hour of delay in performing the paracentesis. So as you know, most of the time we see that the patients are sick and we tend to delay or we tend not to do the ascytic tap. But recently have meta-analysis and studies have shown that if you delay, once you see the patients and each hour delaying the ascytic tap, contribute to the mortality. So what are the indications of, uh, broadly, there are many uh, indications of doing, but nowadays it is said that this is an older uh, guideline, but now whenever you see the ascites, you should tap it. Having said that, these are the different uh, indications, new onset ascites at the time of each admission to the hospital, clinical deterioration in the patients, laboratory abnormalities that may indicate infections, which includes like ascites, peripheral leukocytosis, and so how do you classify the ascites? So the ascites can be classified based on the cell into the uh, uh, portal hypertension related ascites or non-portal hypertension related. And so that may be determined by the high albumin or low albumin gradient. So if the portal hypertension related, that means SAG is more than 1.1, then the causes are alcoholic hepatitis, cirrhosis, heart failure, massive hepatic metastasis, heart failure, constrictive pericarditis, butt carry syndrome, portal vein thrombosis, idiopathic portal fibrosis. And low SAG, you can have peritoneal carcinomatosis, peritoneal tuberculosis, people can have a pancreatitis, cirrhositis, and nephrotic syndrome. So the initial test that should be performed in a site, if you're like on a gross appearance, you can say that this is clear, bloody, cloudy, or lucky, and these all can give you the underlying cause of the ascites. As saying, we are just described about the SARC, cell count and differential that also helps in infection and total protein concentration. So these and the, so these are the essential, but there are certain tests that needs to be done in the ascytic fluid that depends upon the scenario or in the case base. So the special or optional test that can be uh, the culture, glucose concentration, LDH concentration, gram stain, amylase concentration, and unusual taste, like, but that is not unusual for a Pakistani setup. If you think that this is a low sag, then you obviously need to rule out the TB in Pakistani set, setup, ADA, cytology for metastatic disease or malignant disease, uh, triglyceride for chylus ascites, bilirubin concentration if it is a dairy ascites, 
and serum probability in case of the heart failure and metastasis, you need to do the CA level. So these are the optional tests. It depends upon the scenario. You can do these tests on the cytic fluid. So as I told you that the paracentesis should be done immediately if you suspect a uh, infected. So there's a meta-analysis. And this is a study which was published last year, last year in the Red Journal. And it's a very large study which was conducted almost on uh, uh, 75,000 patients in three, of, uh, three or four states of the USA in which this shows that, uh, that there's a significant benefit of doing early paracentesis. And that meta-analysis has shown that if you do the uh, early paracentesis, it increases the all-cause mortality, it decreases the SBP-related mortality, and in fact, it decreases the 30-day readmission rate. Hence, they have report, uh, they have concluded that early paracentesis is associated with the reduced inpatient mortality as B-related more in 30-day readmission rate. So the morbidity and morbid uh, mortality, ambulatory patients with an episode of cirrhotic ascites have a three-year mortality rate of 50%. So deployment of refractory ascites carries a poor prognosis with a one-year survival rate of less than 50%. So the case two, <clears throat> this is again another case uh, whom we are following almost uh, more than a year now. So this is a 60-year-old lady. Uh, this is a very interesting case. So this case, uh, uh, she came to us about two, two, three years ago with the pyloreffian and she has underlying CLD. So at that time it was considered as hydrothorax, a hepatic hydrothorax. But when we tapped that pleural fluid, it was basically low set and, uh, and it was consistent with the TB. So she was treated about three years ago for tuberculosis and she responded very well and she, got, uh, she regained the weight and did very well. And recently she has developed this decompensation. So she's uh, uh, known for five years and her drug history includes the 40 milligram of Lasix, aldecton, rifaximin, PPI, and lactulose. And now she uh, come to us with the abdominal distension. So her workup showed that INR of 1.1, bilirubin of 0.7, not very much a meld. So creatinine of 1.5, sodium is 132, potassium 4.2, alpha fetoprotein is fine. and. Uh, Body fluid albumin is 1.9, ascitic is consistent with the portal hypertension related. Now the questions in this lady, are, as you know that this is a decompensated liver disease, she had a mild uh, renal impairment, and then we have to think of these acute issues as well as the long term. So uh, the, my question was, how do you manage this case? So I'm moving on to this uh, so somehow uh, she was managed and she got discharged because we are okay with the large volume paracentesis but three weeks down the road uh, she again came with the pain fever and abdominal distension now she has developed you know uh, further deteriorate in terms of her creatinine has gone up and sodium has gone down potassium is significantly high bicarb is 13 ascitic fluid uh, was consistent with the infection that is sbp so here, drug-induced hyperkalemia, AKI versus HRS versus drug-induced kidney injuries, spontaneous bacterial peritonitis. Are we dealing with the refractory ascites in this case or not? So the question is, what is refractory ascites? Chanil has already described that, but I will further elaborate on that. Role of ascitic drain on the long term in these cases, since this is the second admission in just three weeks' time, Role of tips, uh, uh, Shanil has touched on that tips. So what is refractory ascites? So the recently the, in the Red Journal about, there's a very, very good uh, review article was published and they defined very nicely the refractory ascites. So that means it is a diuretic resistant ascites that can't be mobilized or the early recurrence of which can't be prevented because of lack of response to dietary sodium restriction and maximum doses of diuretic despite compliance to therapy. So diuretic intractable ascites, uh, ascites that can't be moved. Uh, so the duration of therapy in that is, so this is, a, there, are th there are four or five criteria that fulfills the definition of the refractory ascites. So I'm not going into the detail of that as it has been covered by the um, channel. So, uh, in so there's a, you, you know, when the patient develops the refractory ascites, there is a huge, uh, it's stress on the body that impairs, uh, it almost activates the every system of the body, which, is, which includes the renin and 
aldosterone activation system, immunological response, and then there's the biological surge of the infections, and it leads to different. So this underlying mechanism is a cartoonish picture. So there's a search mechanism, there's a vasodilation theory, these all contribute to the ascites and that in leads to the avid retention of the sodium and leads to the development of the refractory ascites. So in these cases, what should be the option? So each option is correct, depends upon where are you practicing, what kind of the patient is, what the patient's requirements are, what is the patient's education is, and so every option can be considered. It has got the limitations and benefits. So the first, I will go with the TIPS. So more recent data suggests that the TIPS is effective in controlling the ascites in almost 80% of the patients. Significant for, because it leads to significant fall in the renal vascular resistance, which, low, uh, which leads to the better renal perfusion and that decreases the uh, serum creatinine as early as one month post tips compared to the baseline. And R increases the resting energy expenditure, refractive ascites, because of the increased catabolism and increases the protein energy malnutrition that was covered uh, by Dr. Farooq in his talk about the protein energy malnutrition. And that we, we all agree in Pakistani setup that first thing in the Pakistan that happens to these patients once they are told that they have a liver problem, they are going to stop their protein. That misconception is, you know, that is very difficult to dispel from our population. We are trying, or everybody is trying to uh, promulgate that the protein restriction is not advised anymore. As you know, the majority of these are, you know, cachectic patients. So, and then we need effective control of ascites following the tips can lead to the improvement in nutritional status and body composition. So the indication and contraindication of the TIPS insertion indications the patient requires more than two paracentesis per month, patient develops loculatory ascites, patient intolerant of repeated paracentesis, refractory ascites with hepatic hydrothorax. Patient selection is of course, the TIPS is a procedure, but the selection of procedure is very much important and you have to be very, very careful in selecting these patients for this uh, invasive procedure. So the patient should be a uh, younger age, uh, less than 65 years, uh, normal cardiac function and renal uh, provided if they have a renal good renal functions. No prior history of encephalopathy. Child code P score should be in the B, not in the C. Male should be less than 18. There should not be active uh, ongoing infection. And contraindication, of course, older age group if they have a concomitant hepatoma, portal vein thrombosis non-compliance with the sodium restriction. If there's a higher mild score, child C, they have a concomitant heart failure. If they have a pulmonary hypertension, if they have a bleary obstruction or uh, infections, if there are any hepatic cysts. So the, and then obviously, as you know, that the TIPS is associated with certain risks, which includes uh, the encephalopathy, which is the uh, very much, uh, dreaded, can be a dreaded complication in these patients. So. What are the predictors which can lead to the uh, development of the encephalopathy or the complication? These are the predictors based on certain studies and meta-analysis that age over 65, low uh, mean arterial pressure, male if it is more than 15, child C, and hepatic if there's an history of uh, hepatic encephalopathy prior, low, uh, and then uh, and large diameter stent if it is more than 10 millimeter. So that leads to, if you have put the larger stent, that also increases the risk of uh, portal, uh, the portal systemic encephalopathy, or if there is no reduction post tips, then there's a high risk of that these patients will develop the encephalopathy. So regarding the large volume paracentesis, yes, as you all know that we are doing, and these are the patients, majority of the patients are the potential candidates for the transplant, but unfortunately, they don't undergo because of the many reasons. Uh, one is the financial reasons, another is the availability of the centers. Now, luckily we are uh, gaining uh, uh, many centers in Pakistan. Uh, so hopefully that will not be the scenario and our patients will go for transplant at earlier instead of getting very late. So the LVP is the first line therapy in patients with large ascites uh, like grade three, which should be completely removed in a single session. If a patient undergoes large volume paracentesis, that means uh, it's, if it is greater than five liter of ascites, then the plasma expansion should be performed by infusing the plasma expander or the albumin. If it is, and that uh, the, the 
formula for uh, replacing the ascites with the albumin is the eight gram or six to eight gram of albumin per liter ascites removed beyond five liter. So the long-term administration of human albumin, then the, the, the studies are coming up over the, uh, in the last couple of years or five years or so, that the people are trying to give these patients long-term albumin like on daily basis or twice weekly or three weeks. In some of our patients, we do try and that do work very well in some of the patients. So regarding the alpha pump, uh, yes, the, the, it's not very much like it's almost uh, not available here, but the studies are coming up. So device fitted with the sensors in the peritoneal cavity and bladder allowing for the individualized management of situs. This concept is almost a more than decade old initial trial on 10 or 15 patients was published in late uh, 2005 or six uh, on that I did a general club when I was a trainee. So, so right now there are many studies that have been published so far uh, for the refractory uh, on the refractory ascites. It shows definitely reduction in the uh, LBP requirement, but the initial problems are the high pump infection rate as well as high rates of pulp malfunction and catheter dislodgements. So ultimate treatment, as I discussed with uh, that, yes, ultimate treatment is the liver transplant for these types of patients if they can afford to go to the private center or if they can get the chance in the government setup or in the, uh, the center where the free transplant is happening. So then this is the ultimate or the best treatment for these patients. So the case four uh, is case three or case four actually. So there's another patients like a uh, uh, patient, uh, we can take this the same patient who underwent the 10 liter of Ascites uh, in a, and the post procedure became drowsy, dropped map, lab workup showed raise, rise of creatinine, double of the previous, sodium is 125. On inquiry, it was confirmed that the patient didn't receive IV albumin post paracentesis. That we see that majority and uh, uh, the people who cannot afford the albumin is a very expensive. So, uh, so this is a complication that has happened to this. So, the question two words or the, uh, the discussion part is. Is it uh, hepatorenal syndrome type one, hepatorenal syndrome type two? Is it septic shock or cardiogenic shock or post paracentesis induced circulatory dysfunction? So this is again, uh, uh, so it's, the answer is post paracentesis induced circulatory dysfunction because uh, so it is defined as 50% uh, increase in the uh, plasma renal over the baseline on day six. It's a clinical manifestation of paracentesis induced circular dysfunction is renal failure, like in this case, they have a dilutional hypotendremia, like she had, this gentleman had, they have an hepatic encephalopathy, and the plasma expansion sh should be. So to avoid these complications, one should give them the uh, plasma volume by giving the expanders like albumin or something like uh, hamaxil. And it should be given if you are move, removing more than five or six liters of fluid. So incidence of paracentesis in your circuit ranges from up to 80% in some of the studies if it's not taken care very well. So in our setup, in our center, we majority of the time we do give them, because our center is, you know, very private hospital where the people can afford that. So we do give them the albumin. Uh, so we do see less uh, the, this phenomena. Uh, no, I would please. like to request Dr. Om to kindly wrap up his talk. We are, uh, yeah. We've already crossed the time limit, Dr. Om. Yeah, I'm just. Can you wrap up your slide. talk? Yeah, yeah, this is last sir? slide. Okay, sir. Okay. okay. This is last slide. So, so paracentesis inducing, there was a meta analysis that it, uh, this is another study which was published recently in hepatology that has shown that the three classical features of uh, uh, paracentesis in your circulation or the hyponatremia, hepatic encephalopathy, and acute kidney injury. And this is a meta analysis that has shown that. But again, the, uh, the, st the data is like mixed. That uh, some of the studies have shown that the albumin is beneficial, and some of the studies it is not beneficial. And then there is a concurrent review on that as well that has shown uh, like mixed results. So it's not, uh, it's yet to be proven, but yes, we have seen our clinical practices that albumin is very good. So it is one of the related complications of paracentesis and is associated with high incidence of morbidity and mortality. It is often overlooked and is commonly misdiagnosed. And it is a condition which can easily be diagnosed clinically. With this, I thank you.
for patient listening and any question i can i'm happy to answer those uh, questions Thank, Thank you. you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Dr. Om Prakash, for a very rich lecture, very informative on an issue which is widely prevalent in a country where hepatitis and resulting cirrhosis and its complications are endemic. Uh, we have questions. Uh, we have three questions, and I uh, let's start with the first one. Any? Uh, this is from the audience. Any indications except hyponatremia for reducing water intake in patients with cirrhosis and ascites? So I, I believe this is uh, this can be forwarded to uh, Dr. Om Prakash. So, sir, uh, uh, there is a, a general tendency that we uh, we see amongst patients that we see in the outpatient clinics, especially those who have been to GPs or who haven't been to a proper uh, specialist center, as you may say before. And they say that they have been advised to reduce water intake. Uh, uh, so, sir, uh, uh, as we all know, hyponatremia may be cited as a reason uh, uh, for this. What would be uh, uh, your advice regarding the matter? And especially, how should we counsel our patients uh, for the amount of fluids that they can take in? Yeah. So a very good question, a very pertinent question and practical question that we come across uh, daily on daily basis. You know, the first question that they ask is, should we stop water intake? So my question, like my answer to these patients is no, because uh, this water uh, intake, uh, they should restrict is the only sodium. They should take the water, whatever the amount, because this is not the heart failure. Regarding the hyponatremia, obviously this is their two, uh, two or three mechanism which leads to hyponatremia in these types of patients. Number one, they are on the diuretics. Number second, there is an uh, renin angiotensin activating system. So the secondary hyperdosterism that also leads to the hyponatremia. So the water restriction is only recommended if it is there is an SIDH. But the majority of the time, yes, they should just avoid the salt. They should not restrict the water. Uh, okay, so thank you, thank you very much, Dr. Rom, for a comprehensive answer. So we're very clear, but you should be very clear as to how you should be guiding your patients when they ask you to limit water intake. And uh, now uh, I think we can combine uh, questions number two and three because they relate to the talk that was given by Dr. Chanel. Uh, now, now, question two states that uh, is is a high INR contraindicated uh, a contraindication to diagnostic and therapeutic paracentesis. So. Basically, is coagulopathy, does the, Dr. Shanil, in your practice, uh, a very high INR, four, five, seven, does it limit you? Or does it stop you from going for a diagnostic or a therapeutic acidic tap? Especially in patients, for example, where you have uh, a, a, a very low amount of, as they say on ultrasound language, one plus acidic fluid, and you would probably need to send them for an ultrasound guided acidic tap to your radiology colleagues. So in such cases, these patients are usually sent back from the radiology department saying, and the reason cited is a very high INR. And secondly, uh, is, well, let, let's let's stick to this question first and then we can move on to question three. That too will be for Dr. Chanel. Dr. Chanel, can you hear us? Are you with us? Uh, if uh, we are having any problems connecting with Dr. Chanel, if so, I would like to forward this question to our esteemed chairpersons. Would uh, Professor Hosnan Alisha uh, like, to, sir, would you like to comment on this issue? Um, uh, Adnan, Chanel Shan is here and is ready to answer this sir question. i'll uh, i'll ask the it team i think there might be questions uh, there might be an issue with him being uh, 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 muted i'll uh, we'll sort it out uh, dr shanil would, would you kindly would you kindly cannot. speak i i so can i can i comment on the question number 2 and then maybe by the time the oh, yes of course of course dr om so, yes, uh, so there is a misconception about that, uh, the INR thing for a cytic tap already. Uh, so uh, there are uh, uh, meta-analysis and there are a lot of uh, larger cohort studies from the USA and the European. So the INR should not be the contraindication for diagnostic tap and as well as the therapeutic tap. But if you go with the radiology, people don't tap it if you don't correct that INR. So personally, uh, so I, I don't think the INR should be the contraindication for doing the ascitic tap. Rick. Thank you, Dr. And, Dr. Shanil, your comment on this? Are you with us? Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes, yes we can no. hear you clearly. Yes. Okay, thank you very much to Dr. Om for the excellent talk. Um, uh, 
Increased INR is not a contraindicated for diagnostic or therapeutic paracentesis. I'm, I think Dr. Nadeem Tahami has done a presentation on it last year at PSH and in PSG as well. Uh, and he's given presentations elsewhere as well. So uh, uh, just because the INR is high, it doesn't mean that you can't do diagnostic or therapeutic paracentesis. The problem is most of our paracentesis is done by the radiology department. So when they go for uh, paracentesis, then the radiologist says, oh, the INR needs to be less than 1.5. That is bollocks. Uh, no, in, in places where you can do the therapy, diagnostic therapy, uh, uh, paracentesis yourself, I would just uh, encourage you to go and do it yourself rather than sending it for radiology. Uh, overseas, I, um, I don't know what happens in America, but in England, uh, all the paracentesis, whether it's diagnostic or therapeutic, are done by the gastro team on the gastro ward, unless and until it's a loculated diffusion, uh, loculated uh, ascites, or if there is any, you know, uh, a lot of uh, uh, peritoneal vessels or something like that. But otherwise, it's all done uh, within the gastro department. For, you know, for safety purposes, some people do recommend that if it's more than two, uh, just give them some FFPs beforehand. But you know, from the guidelines, none of it is uh, uh, recommended. It's just uh, you know, people's perf uh, personal preference. Thank you very much for, for the answer, Dr. Shanil. Any comments by any of the chairpersons? Adnan, can I say something? This is Dr. Chahab. Yes, sir. Um, uh, yes, Shanil, you are absolutely right. Um, uh, an increased INR is not an absolute contraindication for our diagnostic and therapeutic parasynthesis. Uh, we uh, having a blended approach. Um, at times, we do ourselves. And most of the time, uh, especially if it is a therapeutic parasynthesis, then we usually do under ultrasound guidance. This is the usual um, algorithm and policy in our, in our department. Uh, but for bedside, um, INR, uh, for bedside parasynthesis, INR requirement is not there, especially if it is the diagnostic one. In fact, for the therapeutic also, uh, it is not an absolute contraindication. But for our radiology, they are reluctant. In fact, they will refuse to do any kind of intervention if the INR is more than 1.5. So we as a gastroenterologist remain very comfortable, um, maybe up to two or even more, it's especially if it is diagnostic, but therapeutic also we can do. So the answer would be it's it's not an absolute contraindication, INR. And I would like to add here something that there's no uh, INR value which is to be achieved by given, giving fresh frozen plasma. May it be ultrasound guided or not ultrasound guided. Let us not confuse the issue of who is doing it, gastroenterologist yes. or the radiologist. The bottom yes. line is don't try to achieve a particular as someone yes. said, 1.5 or 2 INR. There is nothing in the guidelines to that. For one's yes. personal satisfaction, one may give fresh frozen plasma, but please do not try to achieve a number. Nowhere yes. in the guideline is it mentioned. Yes. Thank you. I agree that there is no need for achieving the number, but unfortunately, um, if we are subjecting this patient uh, to have a parasynthesis done by the radiologist, then they follow uh, the number we as a gastroenterologist want. Thank you very much uh, uh, for, for clarifying that. I think as uh, Professor Osnan clearly identified, uh, I think this would require us to take our radiology colleagues more on board and allay their fears as regards this procedure. Uh, the last question, uh, I believe uh, uh, what, the, what the audience member wanted to ask was, is SBP and HRS contraindicated uh, to therapeutic uh, uh, parasynthesis? I believe what they want to ask is, if you have a patient who has 10 societies, because I believe that is the only case where you would want to do it uh, in a hurry. It would 10 societies, in, if a patient has a spontaneous bacterial peritonitis, and they ha or they and or they have ongoing hepatorenal syndrome uh, would would that be a contraindication to therapeutic paracentesis if they have 10 societies uh, I, I would like to forward this question to dr chanel for a quick answer because sir we are running uh, running very low on time already ahead of schedule so a quick and concise uh, answer to this by dr chanel so uh, so it's uh, not a contraindication to diagnostic uh, ascites uh, diagnostic
parasynthesis. Uh, with regards to uh, therapeutic parasynthesis, so obviously, if you're doing it for patient comfort and if you feel that the tansocytes is causing more harm to the patient than uh, the SVP and uh, HRS, then you can uh, sort of consider as a palliative measure taking out a small amount of fluid, but not a large volume uh, parasynthesis. Thank you very much, Dr. Um, quickly, Shanil. Quickly, I just want to say, uh, sorry, um, Adnan, just quickly, I just want to say yes, that sir, sir. please ask Hasan Char. He has some practical experience of doing a study and presenting into international forum, especially related to SBP, where he did the um, subtotal parasynthesis with a, with excellent outcome in patient pay the SBP also. Shasab, if you want to say something about it. Yes, Jinaab, you are, I'm pleased that you have brought up this issue. I wanted to bring up this thing that there is nowhere a guideline to say that large volume parasitesis should not be done. That's why we went in from a, for a semi a prospective study at our center and showed that actually the outcome is better if you do a large volume parasitesis because the hypothesis was that if you take away uh, the, uh, the bacteria infested and cytokine infested uh, high protein fluid from the peritoneal cavity, you are doing good to the patient. You've got to do it under proper albumin cover. That's important. But it is not at all contraindicated, but can benefit the patient. Large volume per paracentesis in large uh, volume fluid in the abdomen, dense peritoneal ascites, especially SBP. Do it under albumin cover properly. Thank, Thank you, you very much, Professor Osnan, and I believe uh, this is precisely what some South Korean studies also showed uh, a few years back. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Om and uh, Dr. Shanil. Uh, we would be uh, moving on to our next set of uh, talks immediately. Uh, no break in between because we are ahead of schedule. Uh, we are sorry, we are behind schedule. Um, the chairpersons, Professor Anwar Ahmed Khan, Professor Sayyid Osnan Ali Shah, Professor Jawed Iqbal Farooqi, and Professor Shahab Abid would remain the same for the next set of talks as well, as would be our facilitator, Professor Altaf Alam. The next talk is on spontaneous bacterial peritonitis. We all know that this is the most frequent bacterial infection in patients with cirrhosis, and the incidence varies between 7 and 30 percent. Outcomes in patients are poor since acute kidney injury, acute and chronic liver failure, and death occur in up, in over, up to 60 percent of these patients. An early antibiotic treatment is crucial. The use of albumin as a Complementary therapy for selected high-risk patients is recommended in addition to antibiotics. Although antibiotic prophylaxis has proven to be effective in these patients, careful selection of high-risk candidates is crucial to avoid antibiotic overuse. Uh, uh, the talk on uh, SBP shall be delivered by Professor uh, Dr. Nasir Hassan Luck, who is a professor of hepatology at the Sindh Institute of Urology and Transplantation. Uh, he has uh, close to 100 publications under his belt. Uh, uh, I would like to request Dr. Uh, Professor Nasir Hassan Luck to kindly initiate his talk on sp a spontaneous bacterial peritonitis. Uh, I think we are having some technical issues uh, with uh, Dr. Nasir's log, uh, talk. Uh, uh, Professor Nasir, I request you to kindly uh, wait and we will ha try to have our IT team sort this matter out. Hopefully, this should be done as was done in Dr. Om Prakash's case. Uh, in order to save time, we will move on to the next talk immediately. Uh, the next talk is titled uh, Concerns, Albumin Infusion in Patients with Decompensated Cirrhosis and Ascites. Now, we all know that decompensated cirrhosis is characterized by a systemic pro-inflammatory and a pro-oxidant milieu that causes multi-organ dysfunction. The systemic pro-inflammatory and pro-oxidant states of Hi, everyone. Who thank you for joining us today. I would like to thank the organizers for the kind of... Uh, Dr. Nadeem, I would like to ask you to wait. Uh, I believe uh, there has been an audio uh, disconnect between you and myself. Um, we are sorting it out. Uh, so, as I was saying, the systemic pro-inflammatory and pro-oxidant state of patients uh, who have decompensated cirrhosis is, is responsible for structural and functional changes in the albumin molecule. And these changes spoil uh, the non-oncotic properties of albumin, very important, such as being an antioxidant, scavenging, and immune modulating. The knowledge of these abnormalities provides novel targets for mechanistic treatments. The talk on, uh, uh, on the use of albumin in patients with decompensated cirrhosis and ascites shall be delivered by our dear friend, Dr. Nadeem Tehami, 
who is a consultant gastroenterologist who specializes in hepatology and hepatobiliary medicine at the University Hospital, Southampton, United Kingdom. He looks after patients with a wide range of hepato, pancreatic, obiliary problems and remains not only uh, an academician but a close friend and associate of the Pakistan Society of Hepatology. Dr. Ndeem, I, ask you to, uh, I request you to kindly start your talk on uh, the role of albumin infusion in patients with decompensated cirrhosis and ascites. Dr. Nadeem. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I would like to thank the organizers for the kind invitation. I'm sure you all would have prescribed albumin uh, whilst managing patients with hepatic decompensation. Uh, I will talk about the role of albumin in management of these patients, and we will try to look at it from slightly different perspective. Uh, we will look at the role of uh, albumin as a pleiotropic molecule, um, arterial vasodilatation um, resulting from increased production of uh, nitric oxides, uh, endocannabinoids, which uh, leads to vasodilatation, uh, and that hampers the vascular response to vasoconstrictor. In the end, this leads to uh, effective hypovolemia. Uh, which leads to activation of uh, neurohumeral systems such as uh, renin angiotensin system. And as a result of this, uh, from, a, from, from a functional point of view, patients with advanced cirrhosis will have a uh, effective hypervolemia and they will exhibit uh, cardiovascular hypo-reactivity. Uh, and albumin, uh, with its multidimensional uh, properties, uh, can act on different uh, steps along this pathway uh, and acts as a disease-modifying agent. Um, now, infection is the biggest killer in patients with uh, cirrhosis, and patients with cirrhosis are regarded as uh, patients if they are immuno, as if they are immunocompromised. They do not mount a good uh, systemic inflammatory response. Um, most of them remain culture negative, and those who do have systemic inflammatory response, it's... Uh, atypical. Uh, to begin with, they have elevated uh, elevated um, baseline, so their heart rate is increased. If you go in on the ward rounds, you'll find them, the majority of them will be tachycardic um, with hyperdynamic circulation. Uh, they will have this baseline hyperventilation because of encephalopathy. Um, and uh, the uh, the serum markers that we have, um, uh, CRP, procalcitonin, they do not uh, differentiate um, infectious versus non-infectious driven uh, systemic inflammatory response such as alcoholic hepatitis. So what are some of the um, anti-inflammatory properties of uh, albumin? Um, hopefully this cartoon will help you understand it a bit more. So following an oxidant mediated injury, there's an upregulation of the activation of these oxidant sensitive uh, transcription protein complexes, which uh, promotes inflammation. And what albumin does, it preserves the cellular uh, glutathione, uh, which protects against this oxidant mediated cellular injury. It also um, downregulates the TNF alpha alpha production. Uh, now, TNF alpha. So, TNF alpha. Um, is uh, a validated marker of the monocyte uh, functions in the critical illness. Now, this, this study is really important. Um, and if you, uh, so patients who have acute decomposition of cirrhosis, they will have a higher level of uh, inflammation infection due to the in inappropriate immune response, uh, which is, um, uh, of course, multifactorial. Um, but the immunosuppression and acute decomposition uh, is mediated by uh, prostaglandin E2. And the level is seven times higher in acute decompensation. And when there isn't enough albumin around, they bind uh, to the to these cellular receptors. And uh, from their mediation, it reels to, it dampens the macrophage TNF alpha production. Uh, and so what in this study they found that if they are able to increase the serum albumin uh, uh, by uh, infusing uh, human albumin solution, they are able to restore the appropriate macrophage TNF alpha production. Um, let's look at a few studies very briefly. Um, there are uh, uh, Max is a, is a negative study, so I will not go into a detail of detail of it. Answer studies are positive, so we will try to discuss a little bit more about it. Um, in although the Max study was a multicenter and double-blind placebo-controlled trials, but in the two arms they did not find any significant difference in the incidence of any of these individual complications between the two groups. There was actually no impact on the 
इनके फ्लोपैथी और डिफरेंस इन द रिक्वायरमेंट ऑफ डायरेटिक्स और द और द एडवर्स इवेंट्स नाउ बिफोर वी टॉक अबाउट द आंसर स्टडी लेट मी जस्ट वेरी ब्रीफली टच अपॉन दिस लॉन्ग टर्म एल्बुमिन एडमिनिस्ट्रेशन इन रिफैक्टरी स्टडीज दिस वाज अ ऑब्जर्वेशनल स्टडी बट व्हाट दे कंक्लूडेड फ्रॉम दिस वाज दैट द एल्बुमिन डिक्रीज मोर्टैलिटी ओवरऑल मोर्टैलिटी एंड द कॉम्प्लिकेशन ऑफ ऑफ सिरोसिस no um, so answer study a pragmatic study uh, multi center study it wasn't uh, blinded so uh, there is a risk of bias uh, it was an open label randomized trial um, and uh, so in two arms one with the standard medical treatment arm um, and the other arm with the standard medical treatment plus uh, albumin over a, a period of follow up of about uh, 18 months uh, where they were looking at the primary end point was overall survival and the secondary end point was basically the, the, the complication associated with it so the overall survival was decreased with uh, albumin infusion and then the, even the secondary end point um, in the standard medical therapy plus albumin arm um, the ratio the incidence for the paracentesis refractory societies and the complication and reduced more importantly the uh, there was a significant reduction in the hospitalization and the improvement of the quality of life now let's talk about some of the established indications um so uh, the management of the spontaneous bacterial peritonitis is a recommendation of 1.5 g per kg on day 1 followed by 1 g per kg on day 3 um if you look at the, uh, the this study uh, in two arms one with the antibiotics and the other arm with the antibiotics with albumin uh, in patients who were give uh, who were treated with uh, antibiotics plus albumin uh, there was a significantly decrease incidence of um, uh, re- renal failure um, the mortality both hospital and three month mortality was was reduced um and the infection resolution rate was better in patients who were given antibiotics with um albumin um now i would like to touch upon this study as well because um uh, so whether it was given in a, in a low dose or a higher dose uh, both um proved that by normalizing the serum albumin level uh, they were able to decrease the inflammatory cytokines um but uh, if you look at another study where they used the same amount of albumin as recommended by isel for sbp in patient who have cirrhosis but had some other infection uh, it was associated with pulmonary edema and th- it did not improve the survival rate so it's just uh, uh, just a word of caution um so um uh, f- another indication is prevention of the post paracentesis circulatory dysfunction so following paracentesis it leads to um, it exacerbates the effective hypovolemia uh, which leads to increase in the plasma and inactivity uh, which then leads to rapid reaccumulation of ascites and other associated complication of hyponatremia renal failure and and survival um so what does uh, um, easel recommends that when patients are having large volume paracentesis more than 5 it is they should be uh, offered albumin uh, patients who are not having a large volume paracentesis so in clinical practice we have stopped doing limited volume paracentesis uh, but the initial um, data was not supportive of using albumin however there was a meta analysis um, that included all the uh, available randomized control trial comparing the albumin with the alternative treatment and showed that the albumin infusion significantly reduced the incidence of the um post paracentesis circulatory dysfunction hyponatremia uh, and 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 mortality um we have talked about the management of hepatorenal syndrome um the first line treatment is terlipressin in our practice terlipressin plus albumin um we know about the mark vasodilatation mainly in the splenic arterial bed which is where the combination of terlipressin and and albumin helps it also helps uh, with the so they have underlying impairment of the cardiac cardiac function um which which also um, is improved by by this combination um uh, if you look at the uh, uh, different uh, spectrum of the disease from child pu a to c um uh, the decrease in the cardiac output uh, leads to exacerbation of the effective hypovolemia which is observed in patient with the with the severe disease and that su- suggests that this uh, clinically relevant dysfunction uh, is more in patient with advanced uh, in advanced stages of the cirrhosis so how does albumin help uh, it increases the cardiac contractility contractility how um, by um, its role as a plasma expander 
but also uh, increasing the, uh, the 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 preload. Uh, now, in this uh, um, uh, in this study on cirrhotic rats, um, when they assessed the cardiac contractility and compared the control with cirrhotics, and patients who were cirrhotic were then uh, given either uh, starch or um, albumin. So, the, those who were given albumin, uh, the cardiac, cardiac contractility in, increased significantly compared to those who were given other form of plasma expand, expanders such as starch. So, this although an animal study, but can, uh, supports the role of albumin beyond plasma expander. Um, we have in practice both 5% um, um, versus 20% albumin, so I'm briefly going to mention this study as well, because um, uh, what it tells is that it's not the actual volume. It's if, you, if, if people are resuscitated with 20% albumin, um, decreased amount of the uh, fluid, minimizing the positive early fluid balance, um, and it decreases the resuscitation fluid requirement, and it's not associated with any evidence of harm compared to uh, 4.5 to 5% albumin. So in summary, ladies and gentlemen, and Mr. Chairman, um, we discussed about uh, HAS uh, in the management of um, SPP, post paracentesis dis circulatory dysfunction, and HRS. We intentionally did not talk about some controversial areas. Um, and uh, we conclude that albumin as a as a pleiotropic molecule has potential benefits um, effects which surpasses its oncotic effects. And as I mentioned about the oxidized form of albumin, which hopefully will be able to uh, help us in determining the progress or the course of, of the disease when we are seeing them in the clinic. So thank you very much for listening. Session and. Uh, we have seen um, the audience response currently. We do not have any questions. Therefore, we shall skip the panel discussion for this session and move on to the next set of lectures. Uh, the next talk is uh, a, a talk on the use of beta blockers in decompensated liver cirrhosis patients, uh, whether to continue them, whether to replace them, reduce the dose, or stop them. We know non-selective beta blockers are the mainstay of treatment for portal hypertension in the setting of liver cirrhosis. Recent evidence indicates that non-selective beta blockers could prevent liver decompensation in patients with compensated cirrhosis. Uh, the use of these drugs in cirrhosis in some studies have highlighted relevant safety issues and in patients with end-stage liver disease, particularly with the refractory ascites and infection. Uh, to, for uh, the talk on this uh, very important subject, shall be given by Dr. Raja Afendi Raja Ali. He's the Dean uh, uh, of the National University of Malaysia uh, Medical Center, Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. Uh, I would request Dr. Raja Afendi to kindly start his talk. Well, uh, this isn't a technical glitch. I believe uh, he isn't available right now uh, to deliver his talk. Uh, we shall get in touch with Dr. Raja Afendi. Um, uh, but he isn't available. This isn't a technical glitch, I repeat. We shall be moving on to the next talk in this session, uh, which is titled Prescribing in Decompensated Cirrhosis, Which Drugs Are Safe? A very important and pertinent issue in a country like Pakistan where uh, liver cirrhosis, secondary to viral hepatitis, is endemic, and uh, you have a very high percentage of the population who have uh, liver cirrhosis and other comorbidities. Now, patients who have liver cirrhosis have very serious complications which require multiple drugs for therapeutic or prophylactic use. These drugs are primarily metabolized and excreted by the hepatobiliary system. Hence, liver cell necrosis contributes to impaired drug handling and liver failure and a portal system and hence, most likely, systemic complications. The talk on this uh, subject shall be delivered by Professor, uh, uh, by, uh, by Dr. Bilal Hamid who is an Associate Professor of Medicine uh, at the U uh, University of uh, California, San Francisco. Uh, he's a Clinical Chief in Hepatology, and uh, I would like to request Dr. Bilal Hamid to kindly start his talk. Dr. Bilal? Assalamu alaikum, everyone. My name is Dr. Bilal Hamid. I am an Associate Professor of Medicine at University of California, San Francisco. It is my honor to be invited again for the 20th Annual Conference of Pakistan Society of Hepatology. My topic today is prescribing 
medications in cirrhosis, which drugs are safe. The outline of my talk would include, what are the drug responses in patients with cirrhosis? Does patient with cirrhosis are at increased risk of drug-induced liver injury? The important concept of polypharmacy and drug interactions in patients with cirrhosis. And then I will be talking about some important medication use that all of us need to be aware of, which are statin, proton pump inhibitors, pain medications, and then anti-TB treatment. One uh, important class of medication, which is non-selective beta blocker, which will be covered by my colleague uh, in the session, uh, especially uh, it's an important medication that we need to talk about. Uh, and I'm happy that there is a separate topic in the postgraduate course. Before we talk about it, it is important to know that that responses of medications uh, can be altered or can be unchanged. So therefore, in patients with cirrhosis, the therapeutic and adverse effect can be increased or decreased based on which medications we are using. It also responds, is correlated with severity of liver disease. Uh, there is no clear marker to determine if uh, how to manage or how to monitor the liver dysfunction in patients with cirrhosis. But it's very important to understand that how cirrhosis can affect overall drug response. So there are potential changes in drug handling in cirrhosis, which most of you are aware of. Uh, patients with cirrhosis have impaired hepatocyte, which altered the metabolism and clearance. When you have hypoalbuminemia, you have less protein, which can cause increased drug concentration. Patients with cirrhosis have portal shunting and reduced hepatic flow, which can cause higher bioavailability of medication and serum levels. If you have ascites, it can increase the volume of distribution. Patients with severe or moderate portal hypertensive gastropathy can have altered drug absorption. Similarly, if you have increase in the bilirubin and real dysfunction, it can impact excretion and increase drug concentration. And lastly, we all need to understand that there is a loss of cytochrome uh, P450 metabolic activity, which can have reduced first pass hepatic metabolism and clearance. One of the classic example is the use of pedestinide in cirrhosis, which we don't use because of effect of this first pass hepatic metabolism. So in patients with cirrhosis, there can be some increased pharmacodynamic effect that there are medications, if you use it, can precipitate hepatic encephalopathy, which are opioids, anxiolytics, and sedative. Uh, we all know about NSAIDs causing worsening renal failure as well as uh, precipitate or worsen GI bleed. At the same time, there are decreased therapeutic response in cirrhosis that can be seen with beta blockers, diuretics, and some of the pain medications like codeine. Now, the first thing that we all need to understand is, are the patient with chronic liver disease and cirrhosis at increased risk of drug-induced liver injury? So there are drugs reported that to have an increased risk of hepatotoxicity in patients with evidence of liver disease. And the number one is anti-tuberculosis drugs, which we will talk about at the end. HIV medications, uh, uh, which is we call HART, methamazole, methotrexate use, Welproid, are some of the examples that have been known to have increased toxicity in patients with liver disease. So the first question I wanted to ask all the audience, uh, that if you have development of drug-induced liver injury in patients with pre-existing liver disease, is it associated with worse outcome, whether it's true or false? So you will be thinking about it and then answering this question. So the answer is true. The drug-induced liver injury in pre-existing liver disease is associated with worse outcome. In, uh, there is an NIH network in the United States, and this is a sentinel paper which was published in Gastroenterology in 2015, where they looked at all the patients who have drug-induced liver injury. And this network, which is a prospective study network, 10% of patients had pre-existing liver uh, disease. They were seen in higher frequency of azithromycin-related drug-induced liver injury as compared to patients who does not have liver injury. 
However, in this um, uh, cohort of 89 patients with pre-existing liver disease as compared to 810 with no liver disease, the all-cause mortality and liver mortality was increased, although there was no change in transplant. Based on this, if patient with pre-existing liver disease does develop drug-induced liver injury, it, has, it is associated with worse outcome. We all know about obeta colic acid, which has been approved in May 2016 for primary biliary cholangitis, and uh, since that, FDA has reported 19 cases of death and 11 cases of severe liver injury. And most of these were related that uh, prescribed that were using a more moderate to severe and a higher dose than it was prescribed. And then the main pattern of injury was cholestatic jaundice. Again, pointing that the patient with liver disease or advanced fibrosis, they would have increased risk of drug-induced liver injury. Now, my second question is, what do you think is the most common used medication in cirrhosis? Whether it's diuretics, lactulose use, proton pump inhibitor, diabetic medication, or statin use. So think about it, and there would be uh, about which medication is mostly used in patients with cirrhosis. So the most common used medication in cirrhosis are beta blocker, which is 40% of patients, proton pump inhibitor is 40% of patients, diuretics, then statin, diabetic medications are used in 30% patients, then antibiotic, followed by cardiac hypertensive, and then pain medication. So polypharmacy and drug interaction patient with cirrhosis is a real deal. Average patient with cirrhosis or decompensated cirrhosis are on five different medications. The adverse drug reactions are very frequent, and the common form of drug interaction uh, with uh, or side effects that we see is high potassium, low blood sugars, nephrotoxicity, or worsening hepatic encephalopathy. The common drug drug interaction are potassium sparing diuretic with ACE inhibitors, beta blocker with insulin benzodiazepine with opioids or diuretics with NSAIDs. And this is some of the other interaction that I normally see and you all have to be aware about with drug-related events or combination of furosemide or spironolactone, sedative including benzodiazepine, NSAIDs and opioids, antimicrobial use, beta blocker and potassium supplements. This is the latest article which was published in Hepatology earlier this month. What they wanted to look at, they looked at the large national claims database from 2010 to 2015 to characterize the medication profile in patients with decompensated cirrhosis. They have about close to 12,600 patients with decompensated cirrhosis. The first thing they found out that patients who even had ascites, only 55% or 56% were using diuretics. Patients with hepatic encephalopathy, only 63% were using lactulose. Patients with hepatic encephalopathy, only 32% were using rifaximin. Despite having a varicel bleed, only 60% were using non-selective beta blocker. And patients who had history of SPP, only 48% were using it or getting the prescription of these medications. So the first point of this article is that despite having indications for clinical condition, patients are not on the right treatment, and this is the U.S. data. So this is very important that patients who are, have the right indication, we need to use these medications, and we need to make sure patients are filling out these medications also. Now, the second important thing is that this patient, despite having decompensated cirrhosis, 10% of patients were using NSAIDs, 14% were using benzodiazepine, Look at the opioid use, it's up to 53%, and PPI use for 46%. So the conclusion of this article was patients with decompensated cirrhosis are not filling the indicated medications that are recommended, but also filling medications that are potentially harmful. Therefore, working with their, all the physicians involved in the care, like primary care physician and other specialists, and liver specialist has to make sure that patients understand what medications have been need to be used and what medications can be harmful for them. So this comes to my, uh, this idea about this is very important that anytime you see a patient with decompensated or cirrhosis or liver disease, you need to know what is the indication to start any treatment. If you're using it, if there's any change of dose and duration, you need to be aware about when using these medications with cirrhosis. 
And then what are the side effects of in interaction? So you need to be an amazing physician understanding what other medication patient is taking and whatever medication you will be starting, whether there would be side effects or interaction with that. Other thing is that compliance, you need to make sure whether patient with lactulose or beta block or any other medication are using it regularly. You need to discuss with the patient and the family about why are you using the medication and what is the indication. And then also, especially in the US, we worry about whether the insurance will can cover, but in Pakistan, cost can be an issue where the patient can afford these medications before you prescribe them. So if you have this framework, this is one of the most important thing to understand when you prescribe any medication to your patient with cirrhosis. Now I'm gonna switch in the next five, uh, 10 minutes about some of the important medications that we are using in cirrhosis. I'd like to start with statins. So drug-induced liver injury related to statins are extremely rare. So they're less than two cases per 100,000 patients per year. And if you have it, the injury is mainly idiosyncratic that you cannot predict. It's not mostly related to the dose. So overall, statins are very safe in patients with chronic liver disease. Uh, we also know that pravastatin does not undergo metabolism, uh, but there is no study itself uh, uh, in patients with cirrhosis. And right now, the main reason that we use statin are hyperlipidemia in patients with coronary artery disease. So there is a lot of studies or a lot of uh, data now and a lot of interest of using statins in patients with liver disease cirrhosis and there are a lot of theories out there. And this is becoming a hot topic again. So what we think about statin in portal hypertension it can improve endothelial dysfunction, decrease intrahepatic vascular resistance. It can also improve hepatic blood flow and liver function and there has antifibrotic properties, its effect on stellate cells and everything. And overall, there is a concept that it can improve portal hypertension. And is there any data that in patients without, beside the use of hyperlipidemia and coronary artery disease, where the statin has some role in portal hypertension? So there is an important study which was published in Gastro in 2016, and it's, it is basically a randomized controlled trial, and they wanted to look at patients who have recent episode of esophageal varicell bleed. And they divide into two groups. One is panlication plus beta blocker plus placebo versus panlication plus beta blocker and statin. So they added statin in uh, in, in addition to the regular band ligation beta blocker, they have 158 patients which they straf stratified based on child scores. They started with simvastatin 20 milligram and started five to 10 days post bleed and escalated to 40 milligram uh, by day 15 and followed these patients for 24 months. What it shows, the primary outcome was that whether statin will have an effect of ble on re-bleeding, although based on this graph, there was no difference between the re-bleeding rate between the statin arm in red versus the placebo arm. However, what it shows that the statin did improve survival after the varicell bleed. So this was uh, statistically significant and you can see here, so 17 patients in the placebo group died as come, which is 22 person versus six patient in the semi-statin arm. And the death in patient with placebo, and it, there was mostly other liver related outcomes which were better in the statin group. Although one point to note that there are two patients in the statin group which did have elevate, uh, which have rhabdomyolysis or myositis, that is one of the complications that we worry about the statin use. So based on this randomized controlled trial, it has shown that the statin can improve the overall survival after the episode of varicell bleed. There is also a, a trial from the VA, which is a retrospective trial of uh, in our VA hospital, Veterans Hospital of 40,000 men from 96 to 2009 with compensated hepatitis C cirrhosis. And they found out the statin were associated with decreased risk of decompensation and mortality. And this was adjusted for age, serum albumin, male score, and child score. Now, latestly, this is the uh, latest uh, article which was published in Lancet in last year, that they wanted to look at the safety of two different doses of simvastatin and plus rifaximin and decomposite cirrhosis, a phase two trial. They had like more decompensation with Charles B and C for 12 weeks. So they had simvastatin plus rifaximin 
and uh, semicerin 20 milligram plus your maximin and a placebo arm. And their main goal is to look at the safety of simvastatin or statin, which is the primary on, out, uh, outcome was liver or muscle toxicity. However, what they found out that in these patients with decompensed cirrhosis, if they were using 40 milligram uh, statin plus uh, rifaximin, it was associated with increase in ALT and AST and CK level, requiring treatment withdrawal as compared to 20 milligram. So there is some concern that if you use a higher dose in decompensated cirrhosis, you can cause, uh, you know, uh, muscle injury, and uh, this was one of the major side effects. So overall summary in chronic liver disease use in statin that the retrospective and some randomized controlled trial have shown benefits of statin in cirrhosis for portal hypertension, uh, but we do need additional randomized controlled trial with hard endpoints before we can use statin uh, for recommended use in patients with chronic liver disease. However, uh, in patients who have child C cirrhosis and high dose statin, you can worry about the increased CK level and you also have to pay attention to drug interaction. But the one point is very common in patients who have clear indication of coronary artery disease or patients with hyperlipidemia statins are completely safe. Uh, there is a lot of interest and there are more randomized control trials which are on their way in patients with statin and portal hypertension. So proton pump inhibitor now. So in 2015, PPI ranked the top 10 national healthcare expenditure in the US. It has many different uh, effect or complication that has been or retrospective studies and evidence regarding association is predominantly based on observational study. But the most, uh, one of the most prescribed medication as we talked about 40% of patients with cirrhosis are on PPI. However, two thirds of patients have no indication for the use of PPI. And all the P uh, proton pump inhibitors are metabolized by the liver. It has been associated with uh, SPP, in, uh, increased risk of C. diff infection, and worsening hepatic encephalopathy. The studies are although observa observational and cross-sectional with conflicting results. However, PPI-related re acid suppression can cause bacterial overgrowth and translocation as the possible causes of these complications with PPI in patients with cirrhosis. So if you look at the guidance all, uh, in which was, uh, uh, you know, some of the pharmacological literature that there are different kinds of uh, PPIs and what is the effect. So one point that I wanted to pay attention that esomeprazole, which has no additional risk known in both child C and child AB. However, lansprazole is uh, unsafe according to the pharmacological literature. And the other medication, omeprazole, pantoprazole, and repiprazole is unsafe, although we do need more studies to talk about. But I would say that paying attention, what is the child score and which PPI to be used is important. Uh, these are the FDA indication for actual use of PPI because all these patients are on PPI for different reasons. But if you have erosive esophagitis, treatment of acid reflex, acid re uh, gas risk reduction for gastric ulcer, h pylori. Uh, hypersecurity and short-term maintenance. So you need to know whether your patients on PPI is in the right indication. Lastly, uh, we also, I want to talk about the analgesic use in patients with cirrhosis. I know Farooq will be talking about some of these in the uh, palliative care, but in patients with decompensed cirrhosis or cirrhosis, you need to pay attention what analgesic to be used. Uh, you have to, acetaminophen uh, is still a preferred um, and it is an opioid sparing agent. Um, same with uh, opioid wise, uh, preferred is hydromorphone or fentanyl. I wanted to, uh, normally recommendations to avoid codeine and mepratine. And if you want to use it, use short acting medication opioid with low doses with extended interval. And then you are, if you use miscellaneous medication, I like tricyclic antidepressant. Uh, agent like nortriptyline, desipramcine, and if you want any anticonvulsant, carbapentin is much better than carbapizapine or lidocaine. Always start at a low dose and look for any uh, side effects on these medications. Now, if you look at the metabolic changes of narcotic and other, uh, and other analgesic in patients with cirrhosis, uh, this is just, you can, uh, you know, uh, review it later. However, I wanted to point towards that in fentanyl, uh, there is no active metabolite and it's unchanged child A and B. Uh, child a and B. Uh, mepratine has active metabolite and increase up to 80%. And so we normally avoid, same with the codeine, bioability in cirrhosis I mentioned was reduced. And normally I prefer to avoid in these, medica uh, these medication 
if needed uh, in patients with cirrhosis. And this is an interesting study was published almost 12 years back that despite knowing that paracetamol or acetaminophen is safe and NSAID is unsafe in patients, if you look at the family practice and internal medicine, look at the amount of uh, uh, that how much they are using it as compared to NSAID, they feel that these patients uh, these patients can be still be on NSAID. So teaching the primary care physicians are also very important. Uh, if you look at the antibiotic, I normally tell uh, my patient or primary care using uh, avoiding azithromycin, tetracycline, clone ferricol, and nitrofurantoin in chronic use should be avoided. Lastly, in the next minute or so, I just wanted to uh, have your attention about tuberculosis treatment. Uh, the problem with challenges in treatment of cirrhosis and TB, there is no consensus and guideline, and drug-induced in injury is likely higher. Outcome in Delhi, as we talked about, is poor, so you need to be monitoring these. And then in 25% of only TB cases in Pakistan have underlying chronic liver disease, so you need to understand them. Uh, pyrocytum, uh, pyrocinamide and INH are the most toxic medications in patients with hepatotoxicity, which are the first use anti-TB treatment. Uh, these are the first line of potentially hepatotoxic uh, in the first line, and so less hepatic toxic is in the first line, aminoglycoside, uh, cefiomycin, and ethamputol. And what is the recommendation is normally that if you have child's A, B, and C, so if you have child's C decompensated cirrhosis, should not use any hepatotoxic agent, can use second line agent like streptomycin, ethamputol, or quinanol, extend the duration for 12 months more and caution with amino glycoside. So therefore, it is very important patient with anti-TB treatment that you need to talk to the infectious disease doctors to make sure they are on the right medication and monitor them very closely for drug-induced liver injury. Uh, so in summary, safe use of medication in cirrhosis is an ongoing challenge. Lower doses are recommended for the use of most drugs in cirrhosis. Polypharmacy and adverse drug effect are common in cirrhosis. Statin use is safe in liver disease, but do need further studies to understand benefit for liver disease. Um, BPI should be used uh, in cirrhosis if there is no clear indication. Uh, this is uh, the end of my talk. Hopefully, uh, you know, uh, I will be available uh, for my uh, question answer session since this is a recorded talk. Uh, thank you so much. I have a Thank you very much, Dr. Bilal. Uh, we are going to have a very short Q&A session. We have three questions from the audience. And uh, as I have been told, one is for uh, Dr. Bilal Hamid, and we have two questions for Dr. Nadeem Tehami. So um, uh, we shall be uh, putting forward the question for Dr. Uh, Bilal Hamid first. This question number three. Uh, now, this has been put forward by an audience member. Is rise in uh, creatinine in end-stage uh, chronic liver disease due to statins and is related to sarcopenia. Uh, now, uh, uh, what I would probably understand from this question is, uh, would, uh, uh, can statins cause uh, sarcopenia in patients with end-stage liver disease and can that result uh, in, an, uh, in a rise in creatinine? I, I, I don't think this is uh, they've meant uh, creatinine kinase in this. I believe they meant to write creatinine. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Bilal, your comments on statins uh, and their use in advanced liver disease and any possibility of sarcopenia or other complications due to statin use in patients with advanced liver disease. Yeah, again, I think it's a uh, question is a little bit confusing. I can, I'm just trying to read it, but the CK level, the myositis or rhabdo is one of the main concern for using statin, especially in patients with cirrhosis. And it's more related with the severity of cirrhosis as was seen in the HOPE study. It's just when patients have uh, child C uh, cirrhosis, we have to be very cautious. The question is that uh, what statin to use? And most of the statins have been used in liver disease at Simva statin. There is a recent clinical trial that is going on at Harwa statin. And, uh, but if you look at the hydrophilic statin, uh, Rosuva statin is the most, which we feel that more uh, liver friendly. So we're still learning more about it. The combination and having drug interaction is also a big thing if you're using. So uh, statin does not cause chronic kidney disease or elevated creatinine, right? At the same time, patient with decompensated cirrhosis, risk of sarcopenia, 
And the question is whether that increased the risk of myositis. We don't have the data, but presumably it can be, okay? Thank you very much, Dr. Bilal. Now, I would like to uh, quickly, uh, because we are pressed for time, uh, uh, Dr. Nadeem Tehami, I hope you are with us and I hope you can hear us. Um, I would request- I Yes, I can. Oh, thank you, Dr. Nadeem. So uh, first question, very important. Can dietary protein decrease the need for intravenous albumin in advanced uh, liver cirrhosis? Uh, so can I answer this question in a slightly different way? Uh, so the presentation, unfortunately, did not run the way I wanted to run. So I'm really sorry. Uh, so there are two parts of that. So one, IV albumin is, which is already established indications for the management of hepatorenal syndrome for uh, treatment of post paracentesis circulatory dysfunctions. Uh, so, so, so there are established indications, and that is what we know we give them as required as per the easel guidelines and for SBP. But the protein, the albumin infusion we were trying to talk about was long, moderate or long-term albumin. And so there were studies there, which I obviously quoted. There was one study, unfortunately, which was missed in the presentation was, which was recent uh, attire trial, which was a, a multi-centered trial run recently in United Kingdom for over three years. Unfortunately, the outcome of that trial was that there was no significant difference in the outcome. So they had primary outcomes of infection rate, renal dysfunction, and mortality. So what we conclude from those trials, although it was a bit disappointing, but the trial or the evidence so far, especially the entire trial, does not support the use of the long-term IV albumin. So that's one. So short-term albumin has established indications as, um, as per easel uh, recommendation. Now, can dietary protein decrease the need for IV albumin? Simple if I have to answer the question, no. Because you have to decide whether you're going to give it However, I give you, I'm sure as Farooq Khan was uh, talking uh, that the high protein diet lowers the risk of hepatic encephalopathy. We know that people with cirrhosis need more protein. So obviously this does not undermine the importance of ensuring that your patients are on high protein diet. So, 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 so that's how I would answer it. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Nadeem. Uh, so uh, the second question, albumin uh, versus hemaxyl in large volume paracentesis or hepatorenal syndrome especially in our country. Now, this is unfortunate, uh, but uh, that a situation such as this does result uh, because of financial constraints. Uh, uh, we do have uh, 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 health facilities, tertiary care facilities, which are subsidized by the government, but still high-end medications are very expensive. They are important. So, you know, you, you have scenarios whereby uh, the thought does come to the mind, can we have a more cost-effective alternative? So it's, it isn't just a maxil, I believe. The questions had been raised as regards using fresh frozen plasma. Uh, somebody, uh, there were studies uh, on, on turlipressin as well. But in this particular question, the question has been, the, the, the audience member who has put forward this question, they have specifically focused only on hemaxyl uh, and uh, in large volume paracentesis or hepatorenal syndrome. So uh, yeah. Dr. Nadim, your views on this? Yeah. So... Um... I mean, uh, you have to look at what does um, Hemexil uh, contain. So uh, the albumin that we use is 20% albumin. It's in 100 mil. It's a salt poor albumin. Uh, there is another form of albumin available, which is 5% albumin. Now that albumin and saline, to be honest, is essentially much the same because it is not salt. It is actually not salt poor albumin. Uh, and likewise, Hemexil is a good colloid, but... If I um, remember correctly, I think it does contain um, sodium chloride and uh, potassium and uh, calcium chloride. So with those ingredients, it does not serve the purpose which salt poor albumin um, would do. So therefore, unfortunately, simple answer is um, it does not substitute it. But how would you answer this question in um, uh, in, in sort of low socioeconomic setting? Thank you, Dr. Nadeem. Uh, You've you highlighted a very pertinent know, issue here that really uh, cost constraints say, should yes, not uh, force us into taking decisions that are not backed by solid scientific foundation. Have an, have an but at the same time, it um, also shouldn't curtail our thought to thinking out of the box and trying to explore cost-effective options. And obviously, they should all be done in the context of randomized controlled trials 
child uh, so that uh, they ensure patient safety and physician safety as well. Now, uh, I would, uh, I believe I've been told that Dr. Raja Effendi is online, doctor, and he would be able to deliver his talk. Uh, Dr. Raja Effendi uh, is the dean of the National University of Malaysia Medical Center Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia, and his talk is on beta blockers in decompensated cirrhosis. Do we continue, do we replace, or do we reduce doses of these beta blockers, or do we simply stop? Uh, we know that non-selective beta blockers are the mainstay of treatment in portal hypertension, and evidence indicates that they, they could uh, prevent liver decompensation. However, there have been certain studies that uh, have highlighted certain safety issues in end-stage liver disease uh, when beta blockers are used. So, uh, without further ado, I hope uh, we uh, we are successfully able to have Dr. Raja Effendi on board this time around, and I request Dr. Raja Effendi to kindly uh, start his talk. Dr. Raja Effendi, can you hear us? Yeah. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh, and uh, a very good evening. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairperson. It's always a pleasure uh, to be. Uh, with uh, Pakistani colleagues, and I, <clears throat> I congratulate to all of you to successfully having a new norm of the 20th Annual Congress for the Pakistan Society of uh, Hepatology. I would like to say thank you to Dr. Zishan Ali, the Chair for Organizing Committee and the rest of the committee member for the kind invitation. And it's a great pleasure to see Dr. Bilal, Dr. Nadeh, and the rest of the friends uh, virtually over the meeting. Uh, I do miss uh, Pakistani food, Dr. Adnan. Gulab jamun and all this shish kebab is beautiful indeed. But actually, uh, uh, and the original is from Pakistan and Malaysia, it's not tasteful at all. So I was given a task uh, beta blockers in decompensated cirrhosis, either we continue, replace, reduce dose, or stop. I'm going to talk about factor physiology of port hypertension and mechanism of action of non selective beta blockers the dosing and contraindication and therapeutic windows of non-selective beta blockers, possible benefit in advanced cirrhosis, what are the evidence out there and the recommendation. I think all of us know that non-selective beta blockers are the mainstay of treatment for portal hypertension in the setting of liver cirrhosis for ages, for many, many years, and in fact, more than 30 years or so. And the efficacy of non-selective beta blockers in preventing initial varicose bleed has been demonstrated time and time. And this include the traditional propanolol, nandolol, or timolol, and also with the new non-selective beta blockers, which is increasingly used also by cardiologists at Cavidolol. If you look at, there are many randomized clinical trial that non-selective beta blockers be used and keep demonstrating the benefit of primary and secondary bleeding from the viruses and portal gastropathy, and of course can be used to prevent recurrent vascular bleed in patients. And non-selective beta blocker also can potentially reduce bacterial translocation and the risk of SBP and ultimately increase the survival independent of bleeding event. It has been suggested many times that the non-selective beta blockers can potentially decrease the risk of hepatocellular carcinoma. And cavidolol in particular has a greater effect on the reducing portal pressure than traditional uh, beta blockers such as propanolol that we use routinely. And of course, cavidolol has a significant clinical benefit as a new indication in compensated liver cirrhosis. If you look at the pathophysiology of a portal hypertension cirrhosis here, it's a busy diagram because of the hepatic vascular resistance of two components, mechanical component because of destruction or the liver architecture and dynamic component because of the related to endothelial dysfunction, increasing a lot of vasoconstrictors and dotlin and uh, vasodilators of uh, nitrous oxide were reduced and these are uh, releasing vasoconstrictors and also affecting the splenic vasodilatation, increased portal venous blood flow, and then uh, with the VGF also contribute to portal hypertension. On the cardiac output side, with the systemic vasodilatation leading to effective hypovolemia and triggers expansion of the plasma volume, hence increasing the cardiac output. 
if you look at the, this is from the medical school, really, the site of action of non-selective beta blockers, where beta-1 adrenergic blockade reduces the heart rate and cardiac output, and hence reduces the cardiac flow. And of course, the beta-2 blockade are causing the splenic muscle constriction due to unopposed adrenergic tone, and subsequently reduce another 15% of portal blood flow. And on the top, beta-1 blocker reduced the portal flow about 20%. And, you, and we can get 35% of total reduced uh, collateral blood flow. And uh, non-selective beta blocker also cause the mild increase in peripheral hepatic resistance via unopposed energy tone. And cavinolol is unique because it has intrinsic anti-alpha-1 adrenergic effect that cause intrahepatic vasodilatation, and of course, further reduce the portal pressure that we want in portal hypertension. And so these are schematic pathological basis why we use non-selective beta blockers in portal hypertension. As I mentioned you early on, blocking the beta-1 can reduce the portal flow of 20%. A reduce of beta-2 can reduce the portal flow of another 15%. And the uniqueness of the cavidolol uh, targeting alpha-1 blockade, uh, reducing intrahepatic vascular tone, further reduce the portal blood flow and met more, may, met more benefit for our patient. And this is, uh, again, a busy diagram if you focus on the green, where the cavidolol, papanolol give this beneficial effect in terms of uh, a blockade, the beta-1 and beta-2, in terms of preservation of the inotrophic uh, competence and counteracting increased cardiac output, and hence potentially decreasing the systemic vascular, vascular resistance in the case of port hypertension. If you look at the cavidolol in the red color, where they can potentially uh, in the case of decompensated liver cirrhosis, they can make it inadequate renal perfusion, and this can potentially can cause acute kidney injury, at the same time promoting peripheral vasodilatation, and the patient can have further hypotension and dysfunction in the cardiac. So the red markers, if using cavidolol in the decompensated cirrhosis, may give a further a detrimental effect for the patient, as opposed to give to propanolol and cavidolol in patients with compensated cirrhosis, as you can see on the green, which is cause beneficial effect to the patient, and the yellow may potentially cause harmful in patients with uh, either in compensated cirrhosis or also in the decompensated cirrhosis. So if you look at the current guideline on the uses of non-selective beta blockers from the pre-primary phospholexis, more than, more than one random mushroom trial, a failed to show prevention of large viruses and more adverse events. So there's no indication for prevention of, prevention of the viruses or progression. If you look at the prevention of decompensation, a random mushroom trial is indicated, prevention of the first and the uh, vessel bleed and prevention of vessel re-bleeding is indicated because of uh, really uh, showing the decreased bleeding and rebleeding time and ultimately improve the survival. What about for gastric viruses? No strong evidence of indication for non selective beta blockers, but there is uh, evidence to decrease rebleeding in the case of portal hypertensive gastropathy when we use non selective beta blockers. If you look at this survey done a couple of years ago uh, uh, by more than 600 respondents, look at the uh, no consensus really of the standard dose of the antitration principle of non selective beta blockers. Either they want to achieve reduction of 25% of the heart rate or the achieve 50 to 55 bit per minute, or whether the patient tolerate of different dose, whether the highest tolerated dose or until the minimum of 55 bit per minute, or the fixed dose of uh, beta blocker 80 milligram, or people rather use uh, hepatic venous pressure gradient as a guidance therapy for portal hypertension. If you look at here, the study here, in terms of contraindication and reinstitution, among the survey, there's a huge disagreement on the list of contraindication for non-selective beta blockers, whether we should give in patient with refractory ascites, SBP, HRS 102, or the mean arterial pressure less than 80 is still debated, but I'll show you some evidence. And I think this is back again to the medical school where there are contraindication, either absolute or relative of taking beta blockers. If we all know what degree of the secondary or third degree of heart block, of course, critical in ischemia or severe asthma, also be 
uh, careful as well in terms of poorly controlled diabetes with many episodes of hypoglycemia, also a relative contraindication using non-slap beta blockers. And also consider to reduce the dose, not to stop the beta blocker if the systolic hypertension is more than less than 90 millimeter mercury or mean arterial pressure less than 65 with the development of acute kidney injury or hypothyroidism syndrome and with the low or uh, hyponatremia. And of course, we all this see this uh, other adverse effects such as uh, erectile dysfunction in male patient. If you look at the appropriate dosing target and follow-up available for the non-selective beta blockers for prevention of the first bleeding, as you can see on the slide here, propanolol in particular starts slow, goes slow, 20, 40 milligram uh, twice a day, increasing by 20 or 40 milligram, and you target the reduction of 25% of the heart rate in other words, if the baseline heart rate is 80, then you target about 55 to 60 after you follow up in the clinic. If anadolol, again, not, uh, not many people using as opposed to proponolol, more like the same principle up to the 160 milligram or sometimes above uh, if the patient has no ascites. For cavidolol, mostly used by traditionally by cardiologists that we all using now, started with a low dose again, 6.5 milligram once a day. And after a couple of days, you can increase twice a day, give a rise to 12.5 maximum dose, or you can consider higher doses twice a day, which is 25 if the arterial hypertension is more evident. Again, it's very important in the, in the setting of liver cirrhosis when the systolic blood pressure is very common regardless of etiology of liver cirrhosis. If the systolic blood pressure less than 90 millimeter mercury, try to avoid this dose or probably use a very, very minimal dose or to treat it very, very slowly. And this is the concept of how uh, progression or deterioration of liver cirrhotic in terms of hemodynamic and potential effect of beta blockers. It's a busy slide you can see here early on where the decrement of the SVR, where the compensated uh, cardiac output, increasing cardiac output to maintain a certain amount of mean arterial pressure. And when an increase of cardiac output cannot further compensate for vasodilatation, then the patient was, will have a consequence of secular dysfunction and then hypotension in which the maximum activation of the SNS or sensory neural humoral system and so leading patient to have refractory ascites, hypotonatremia, and then you get hepatorenal syndrome, so and so. So these are classic examples how the beta blockers interfere with the increment of cardiac output that may potentially shift the curve to the right, then leading to the significant hypoperfusions in the kidney. So if you look at the window hypothesis here, again, the busy slide on the left side, early cirrhosis, the middle decompensated and last end stage cirrhosis, you can say that in the early cirrhosis, beta blocker have no effect on survival but may decrease adverse event. This is simply because the cardiac reserve is still pretty high. The sympathetic nervous system and RAS system is still on the kick on. So it is not really recommended to use beta blocker for the cirrhosis. Perhaps a lot of patients with metabolic syndrome, NASH in the cirrhosis, uh, we should use beta blocker as a part of cardiovascular indication rather than liver cirrhosis per se. And if the patient progress to the disease progression where the kick on of the sympathetic nervous system and rush system and where the cardiac reserve tend to be reduced, where we should really start beta blocker because these therapeutic windows, the beta blocker actually improve survival by reducing the chance of having very severe bleeding. And of course, more importantly, also gut bacteria translocation that giving rise to SBP. At this this is progression where the between the in the middle, as you can see in the graph there, where the cardiac reserve is still intact but steadily decline. In clinical practice, it's very difficult. Whether how do you determine cardiac reserve? Whether do you do measuring a proper cardiac echocardiogram? We can measure really how the rust and sympathetic nervous system activity. Again, this is a clinical diagnosis, and more importantly. Uh, by prescribing beta blockers, not only the reduced rebleeding, but also uh, increase the risk of gut bacterial translocation, also slightly increase the risk of mortality. <clears throat> when the patient go to the end stage of liver cirrhosis with the refractory ascites, beta blocker reduce survival 
due to significant negative impact on the cardiac reserve. As you can see, the red line there is reducing and hence reducing the perfusion or hypoperfusion to the vital organs, including the kidney, can precipitate hepatorenal syndrome. So when the cardiac compensatory reserve critically impaired in the end-stage liver cirrhosis, if we give the beta blocker, this may further make the hypotension uh, cause a trouble to the patient. And at this moment of time, the sympathetic nervous system and rust are the maximal and cannot compensate anymore with cardiac output. Hence, the risk of the mortality is high, much higher compared to before, and also risk for the gut bacterial translocation. So this diagram are really uh, beautifully demonstrated when we should use beta blocker in our liver cirrhotic patient. So the question is, use of non-selective beta blockers in advanced cirrhosis, is it effective in preventing very severe bleeding in patients with ascites as a primary prophylaxis? The answer is yes. A lot of uh, trials have been done and non-selective beta blocker were effective in preventing the first episode of very severe bleeding and of course, reducing related mortality independently of the severity of liver disease or the presence of ascites. You can look here at, uh, in New England Journal many, many years ago, how the Conclusion is that the traditional beta blocker, propanolol or hardly to see no another law in Malaysia are very effective in preventing a first bleeding and reducing the mortality of rate associated with GI bleed in patients with liver cirrhosis. What about the use of non-selective beta blocker advanced cirrhosis? Is it effective in preventing bleeding in patients with ascites? Well, there's an individual patient meta-analysis of 400 patients comparing with beta blockers plus uh, bending ligation versus bending ligation alone in child B and C, it shows that combination therapy improved both rebleeding and the survival time. As you can see here, the uh, forest plot the diamond uh, shift to the less favor to combination a combo treatment with the beta blocker uh, plus uh, ligation therapy for rebleeding and increased survival. What about the use of non-selective beta blocker in advanced cirrhosis? Is it safe in patient with ascites? Uh, well, you, as you can listen uh, just now from Dr. Bilal, uh, a beta blocker is commonly prescribed, but at this moment of time, overwhelming evidence does not suggest that beta blockers are deleterious in patient with cirrhosis or ascites. If you can see here, a study a couple of years ago, and uh, you can see here on the blue plot, patient on the propanolol traditional non selective beta blockers, in this case, significant reduction of mortality risk among patients receiving a, a, a beta blocker as compared to those not receiving beta blocker in terms of survival. So there is a benefit, not only in the mildly decompensated cirrhosis, but also in severely decompensated cirrhosis. What about the dose of the beta blocker? As you can see in the panel A for mildly and B severely decompensated cirrhosis. If you can see the on the top panel, which is red, where patient use a propanolol at the doses below 160, the mortality has lower as compared to the patient who take the higher dose of propanolol. And these are the lessons that we learn in terms of using, I can see from the question just now from Dr. Bilal, with actually when or what dose of propanolol we should use for our patient. So if you look at the non-selective beta blockers, really do not affect mortality and cirrhosis and post hoc analysis, 52-week uh, cumulative all-cost mortality similar in non-selective non, um, beta blockers as opposed to non-users, but the, eventually the non-selective beta blocker did not increase mortality in the subgroup of patients with refractory ascites. Of course, there are some factors that may add safety to the use of beta blockers, in particular those who get hypotension and AQI were excluded in the study, but nevertheless, uh, non-selective beta blocker also was discontinued in the acute event in the case of SPPHRS also bleeding. What about is non-selective beta blocker contraindicated in specific subpopulation of ascite patient with lecture refractory ascites? The answer is non-selective beta blocker were associated with poor survival in patient with refractory ascites. And beta blocker also cause parasynthesis induced circulatory dysfunction in patients with cirrhosis and refractory ascites. 
However, some retrospective study done a couple of years ago that shows that no difference in mortality between beta blocker users and non-users in patients undergoing regular parasynthesis at the low dose of propanolol of 48.9. The subgroup of over 500 patient effective scientists show there's no increased mortality either using uh, non-selective beta blockers. As you can see here, the study from Thailand systemic review and meta-analysis, the use of beta blocker was not associated with significant increase in all cost mortality. You can see the diamond shade on the dot, on the right in the middle, uh, uh, in the case of patients with cirrhosis and ascites or repetitive ascites. However, this meta-analysis do not support the position that non-selective beta blockers be routinely will help from patients with ascites. So the next question is, if non-selective beta blockers contraindicated with specific subpopulation of SIT patient with SBP. So the point that against the use of beta blocker, as you can see in study by Bandefer a couple of years ago, showed that beta blockers non-selective beta increased the risk of hypertorinal syndrome, acute kidney injury, and also reduced transplants free survival. This is large sample and retrospective, but unmatched data. What about the favor to use this? Again, over 360 patients, a patient with first peritonitis episode, follow up over two years, there is significant reduction of mortality was observed in patients using a propanolol as opposed to non-propanolol. And of course, again, this is a retrospective register and large sample cohort. Another study over 200 patients uh, showing that non-selective beta blocker was associated with higher 28 days transplant free survival only patients with SBP and arterial pressure of less than 65 associated with renal impairment. Again, limitation is retrospective and a short follow-up. What about the dust being on beta blocker impaired immediate outcome in patient present with acute bleed or sepsis or shock? A uh, couple of years ago, retrospective analysis of a small number of patients who were admitted in ICU with sepsis or shock, beta blocker were discontinued once the patient hemodynamically instability was developed and ICU mortality was similar between previous beta blocker use and non beta blocker user group. Both groups had identical hemodynamic parameters, supporting the idea that previous treatment with beta blockers does not have negative impact if beta blocker is stopped upon the episode of hypertension when patient was admitted in ICU. If you look at over here, been on the therapy of the beta blockers, which is broadly used either in primary or secondary prophylaxis of bleeding, does not represent a negative predictors of the short-term survival of patients with acute varicose bleed. As you can see here, a study done a couple of years ago, look at they are not very really significant whether you uh, 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 got a short-term survival or acute bleed or not as a primary or secondary prophylaxis. What about the expanding consensus in portal hypertension? You can see the report on the Bevan consensus in terms of safety of non uh, uh, selective beta blockers in the end stage group. Uh, quest, uh, uh, no contraindication may be absent when the therapy is firstly prescribed, but need to be monitored during evolution of the disease. Close monitoring is necessary in patients with refractory ascites or need the dose reduction or discontinuation where the patient got hypotension or AKI, and if beta blockers stop, endoscopic band ligation should be performed. And as a secondary prophylaxis in patients with refractory ascites, patient with cirrhosis and refractory ascites, beta blockers should be used cautiously with close monitoring, again, clinical markers, blood pressure and sodium, as well as serum creatinine. And anti-randomized trials are available, beta blockers should be reduced, discontinued, if patient with refractory scientists and develop all these parameters, systolic blood pressure less than 90 or hyponatremia or AKI. And of course, we have to assume that all the other costs, as Dr. Bilal said, and said, which is culprit to cause this has been removed, and consequences of the discontinued beta blocker in the setting of secondary prophylaxis are unknown. So if the patient continue to be intolerant for a beta blocker, perhaps the patient should be offered for tips. And again, it's not available the whole country. Again, depends on the availability. And if there was a clear precipitant, for example, SBP, reinitiation of beta blocker should be considered even after abnormality of the parameters go back to resolution after the removal of the precip uh, precipitants. So the 
clinical scenario of recommendation, progressive atrial hypotension, uh, after we treating the sepsis that causes hypotension, reduction of uh, non-selective beta blockers, discontinue or monitor blood pressure, switching from cabidolol to propanolol, consider albumin that Dr. Nadim has alluded early on, and of course, a primary prophylaxis considering switching to EBL, bind ligation, secondary prophylaxis, maintain with beta blocker at the lower dose. For those intolerance, perhaps uh, initially can initiate at the lower dose and consider switching from propanolol to lower dose of uh, cabidolol to propanolol, and of course, primary switch to the band ligation or secondary prophylaxis, consider the tips. In the case of refractory scientists, reduce dose or discontinue beta blocker if the blood pressure less than 90 or high serum creatinine, more than 1.5 or hyponatremia. And of course, primary prophylaxis, you switch from the non-selective beta blockers to the band ligation. Secondary prophylaxis, you maintain at the lower dose and try to avoid higher dose. As you can see early on from the graph, the mortality is higher at the dose of the propanolol and do not use cabidolol in refractory ascites. For the SBP, again, reduction of the dose, the same blood pressure I mentioned you on the birth, primary prophylaxis considering switching to the band ligation and again, losing a lower dose for secondary prophylaxis and of course, a prophylactic antibiotics for recurrent SBP. So ladies and gentlemen, the non-selective beta blockers in a nutshell require careful titration up and down. The fixed doses are really discouraged. In patients with intolerance, consider a smaller dose, start slow or go slow, switch to different non-selective beta blockers before completely discontinue the treatment. A patient with worsening renal or liver dysfunction, many reduction of the dose and discontinue the non-selective beta blockers temporarily, reassess the risk and benefit of the medication periodically, and because each patient will develop a relative absolute contraindication later in the life, and we have to monitor, of course, the systolic blood pressure as mentioned to you, the cutoff 90 millimeter mercury, renal function for uh, refractory ascites, and about the higher dose of propanolol more than 160 in patients with refractory ascites because it can cause higher mortality. I use a low dose instead, seem to be safe and effective. And cavidolol should not be used in patients with severe ascites due to higher risk of inducing arterial hypertension, as you remember from the graph where cardiac output is compromised. And there's no need to discontinue beta blocker in patients with refractory ascites or SBP if there's no evidence of severe circulatory dysfunction. And temporarily hold beta blocker in secular dysfunction and patient with bleeding or septic shock and reinitiation of or titration beta blocker should be considered after resolution of circulatory dysfunction. Thank you so much for your kind attention. I would like to invite, hopefully COVID will goes away, physical meeting in Kuala Lumpur next year, and we will decide in January whether we can do this meeting virtually. Thank you for your kind attention. I pass back to the Mr. Distinguished Chairman. Thank you very much, Dr. Effendi, for a wonderful talk. And we know you've been up. It's uh, 1.45 a.m. in Kuala Lumpur right now. So thank you for staying up for us. Uh, without further ado, uh, we would be moving on to the next talk, actually a first talk which had been delayed due to technical issues, I hope. These have been resolved. So we're going to try to have Dr. Nasser Hassan Luck on board for the third time for his talk on spontaneous bacterial peritonitis. So I hope the issues are resolved. Let's see. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, today, uh, in this session, I'm really thankful uh, to the PSH uh, for this nice forum. This clinical issue is very important for the clinicians, hepatologists, and uh, we have been treating it for the last many years. We take this case scenario of a 55 years old gentleman who has cirrhosis of liver, recently been treated, hepatitis C, having GI bleed, febrile, the patient is febrile along with abdominal pain for the last less than a week. The aesthetic fluid analysis is always done when the patient is admitted. It shows high TLC with uh, neutrophilia. He was given uh, empiric treatment straight away with the third generation cephalosporins. The aesthetic fluid uh, TLC was again checked after 48 hours, which shows 
a further increase in the cell count and uh, although the glucose is 65 mg per deciliter and protein is low chest x-ray is normal if we keep on discussing this scenario we'll see the spontaneous uh, bacterial peritonitis has been defined as a bacterial infection of aseptic fluid without any intra-abdominal surgical treatable source of infection, is quite common in cirrhotics. HVP is, a, is diagnosed when a culture is positive for ascites in ascites and there is a high uh, count of uh, neutrophil, especially leukocytes and neutrophils are more than a certain number. The in-hospital mortality rate of SBP is staggeringly high, it is 30%. And the mortality being generally due to the complications such as acute varicell bleeding, uh, which is a alongside problem. Same in the scenario you see that the patient had GI bleed, further complicating the issue. And development of renal uh, problems like the uh, septic ATN or the hepatorenal syndrome. Uh, which is again one of the indicators of progressive liver disease. If we go about the pathophysiology, there are many factors which contributes especially to take into consideration is the bacterial translocation and uh, less opsonization of the bacteria at a place where it is seen. One of the major factors responsible for SBP is bacterial translocation, as we already discussed. Uh, there are certain changes in the gut wall which can lead to this problem. The bacterial translocation is favored by the bacterial overgrowth, which is one of the part and parcel of this disorder. The alteration of the intestinal mucosal impaired local and systemic immunity and use of uh, proton pump inhibitors. There is low acid, more bacteria, more frequent and longer, long-lasting bacteria occurs in cirrhotic patients because of their immunosuppressed state, which is a relatively immunosuppressed state, which are principally due to the hypoalbuminemia and because of the proto-systemic shunts with the alter functioning of mononuclear phagocytes. If we go further, Apart from the bacterial translocation in uh, CLD, there is increased intestinal permeability caused by the normal bacterial flora, which can lead to SPP. The multiple studies have been uh, done in this regard to at least pinpoint the gram-negative bacteria are the most common cause of SPP, with three most common organisms classically been found is E. coli, Streptococcus, and Klebsiella. But uh, this balance is different in different uh, tertiary care settings. But again, the gram-negative bacteria is more than the gram-positive ones. If you go about this question, so if a 45 years old male with history of hepatitis B associated chronic liver disease, admitted with complaints of hematemesis and melina. On examination, he was found to have altered level of consciousness and uh, he had a distended abdomen with the elicitable fluid thrill. On workup, he was found to have hemoglobin of 6 gram per deciliter and platelet of 8,000. So, what is the indication of diagnostic paracentesis uh, in your opinion? Uh, okay, I think so. The best option will be history of upper GI bleed. If we go further, patient with SBP may have one of the following uh, local symptoms and signs of peritonitis. The signs of peritonitis are like the abdominal pain, abdominal tenderness, which is uh, not really localized to one point, but it is generalized, vomiting, diarrhea, Sometimes the patient can present with ileus. However, the signs of 
systemic inflammations, hyper and hypothermia. Uh, the patient can be in sepsis, uh, altered white uh, counts. It can be uh, leukopenias and leukocytosis. They can be tachycardia, tachypnea, and worsening of liver function test from the uh, previous baseline and the hepatic encephalopathy, worsening hepatic encephalopathy, shock, renal failure, and GI bleeding as associations of this problem. So there are certain patients with an aesthetic fluid neutrophil count of more than 2,500 uh, cells, uh, but the culture is negative. They have culture negative SBB. So this is a, a variety which we often see in our setup, although the inoculation is done at the bedside. The bacterial site is in which the cultures are positive, but there is normal aesthetic neutrophil count is again seen as the second most common. Uh, well, the patient we discussed before starting this uh, deliberation had exposure of antibiotics and his SP was not settling. We'll go about the normal variety of community acquired SPP, the empiric antibiotics started immediately. What are the consensus? Uh, the third generation cephalosporin, as in our case, was started uh, with low bacterial resistance. And uh, there are other antibiotics like uh, Piptazo and carbapenems. In countries like us with higher bacterial resistance, we are moving towards more broad spectrum antibiotics. And as we see, there is a lot of resistance and uh, this is leading to uh, more difficult uh, scenarios like these patients uh, treated on empiric treatments are not responding and they are multi-drug resistant bacteria and uh, there are lots of antibiotic choices which are nephrotoxic and in combinations has to be given to get rid of this problem. we see that uh, the community acquired is easily treated. The healthcare associated or nosocomial has a uh, more difficult outcome in terms of uh, treatment and the presentation is mostly more dreadful. So the efficacy of antibiotic therapy should be checked with the second paracentesis at 48 hours as was done in our case as well. And the failure of first line antibiotic therapy should be suspected there is worsening of clinical signs and symptoms or increase or no uh, reduction in the baseline uh, leukocyte count in the coming 20, 48 hours. So SVP without septic shock may precipitate deterioration of circulatory functions with severe liver failure and a scenario of acute on chronic liver failure can develop in this uh, scenario and it is a common ICU findings in these patients who are already advanced uh, MELD scoring or child scoring and they're presenting with SPP and their bilirubin is now further worsening with hepatic encephalopathy and they are uh, entering into one of the phase of type 1 HRS and it's approximately 20% hospital mortality, which is a daily experience of a hepatologist practicing in hospitals. So the other limb of treatment is IV albumin, and it has to be given in correct dose, although it becomes quite uh, expensive and hefty, but it is a life-saving uh, treatment. When to initiate the baseline uh, bilirubin is more than 4 mg per deciliter and serum creatinine is more than 1 mg per deciliter and it is increasing in further coming days then we have to start it. Since most episodes of SPP are thought to result from the translocation of enteric gram negative bacteria the ideal prophylactic agent should be safe, affordable and effective at decreasing the amounts of 
these organisms from the gut while preserving the protective anaerobic flora at the same time. There are certain high risk conditions that have been identified to give prophylactic antibiotics SPP such as acute GI bleed, history of SPP or low protein in the acetic fluid, no history of SPP, cirrhotic patients with low acetic fluid protein concentration and or high serum bilirubin levels are at high risk of developing a first episode of SPP. So these patients can be given uh, prophylactic antibiotics upfront. So if we go about uh, this scenario, then the 48 years old man, uh, you will see the age is in the same range in all cases. Probably we like these uh, age group patients. Uh, known case of hepatitis C associated uh, chronic liver disease uh, currently is being admitted with the complaints of again GI bleed. On examination, the patient is pale, ecteric, the blood pressure in supine position is 100 over 60 millimeter mercury and abdomen is distended with shifting dullness. On clinical and lab assessment, he has a CTP score of C10 and uh, had new onset ascites on ultrasound as the previous ultrasound was showing no ascites. An ascetic workup revealed because it's the first time identified ascites and it has to be tapped. It reveals high SARG, low protein, Aesthetic TLC is 80. He has serum creatinine of 1.1 milligram per deciliter with serum sodium of 124 milligram per liter. And the serum albumin is 2.5 gram per deciliter is slow. So what is the indication of starting SP prophylaxis in this patient in your opinion? I think so. If we review these four responses, the most appropriate would be advanced CTP score that is C10. Okay, uh, further advancing the discussion of primary prophylaxis with norfloxacin, which is historically very famous, should definitely be uh, commenced if patient is having a CTP more than B9, bilirubin more than three milligram per deciliter, acetic fluid uh, protein, uh, is less than uh, 1.5 gram per uh, deciliter and worsening renal function, hyponatremia and uh, there are lot, lots of trials which shows a survival benefit in this patient is given prophylaxis at the right time. So further to discuss norfloxacin can be stopped if there is improvement in the clinical condition of the patient for there is this disappearance of ascites. So the stop rule would be disappearance of the ascites. Now to discuss the second most important thing, the ascites SBP consider liver transplant. It is a win-win situation and the definite treatment and one of the very plausible indication for liver transplantation. So what is secondary prophylaxis? It's very important to know if we discuss norfloxacin can uh, was more effective in prevention of SBP recurrence due to uh, the enterobacteriaceae group of bacteria and the use of intermittent intermittent ciprofloxacin high dose twice weekly has been associated with a higher rate of kinolone resistance. Uh, it's a worldwide phenomenon and organisms. Uh, was resistant to this very important antibiotic. So the very new addition to the armamentarium of uh, non-absorbable antibiotics is the rifaximine. Uh, although it's effective against recent SBP, but there's no data which shows that uh, it can be given for primary or secondary prophylaxis in SPP patients. So, for secondary uh, prophylaxis, norfloxacin, although is recommended, 
the Chaksimini is currently uh, doesn't uh, have a backing of data for a recommendation. And secondary prophylaxis with ciprofloxacin has lots of ordeals in terms of resistance. Uh, nearly all patient has to take PPI one or the other way and uh, it is quite dangerous in patients of advanced cirrhosis which increases the risk of SPP and mortality so PPI has to be avoided in these patients. So what are those scenarios uh, in which we have to see uh, one of the very dangerous varieties of SBP the difficult to treat one. So there are these factors in the clinical and the bioeconomical factors which are the risk factors for this type of SBP are acetic fluid albumin I already alluded to is less than 1.5 gram per deciliter and again increased melt scoring below been more than 3.2 milligram per deciliter platelets less than a lag and low C3 levels. In the genotypic risk factors is the polymorphism in the monocytes chemotactic protein 1, NOD2 and TLR2 although it's a basic uh, uh, research but again it has been proposed. Uh, just for the completion of topic it's been mentioned but uh, although clinically we don't have the uh, luxury to have these tests with us. The itogenic risk factors are the use of PPI and history of invasive procedure. If we see that the nosocomial variety which we are discussing in our patient has a high risk uh, group and uh, we have to use IV albumin with, along with carbapenem in this patient because as we have checked the 48 hours acetic fluid shows increase in the neutrophil counts and the patient is symptomatic. So we can use carbapenem in our patient. So what are those factors associated with the mortality in SPP? Uh, there are quite some numerical numbers in this regard. In hospital mortality with the SPP is 20 to 40 percent uh, depending on the case. And the renal dysfunction is 54 percent high CTP score, high MELD score, age more than 60 years and below with more than 4 mg per deciliter. The hyponatremia is again one of its own risk factors associated with this scenario. I would conclude that the SBP is a unique clinical problem patient with decompensated liver disease. If treated promptly, mortality can be effectively reduced. Knowledge of different types of SBP can help us in guiding different treatment strategies and SPP prophylaxis can help reduce the one-year mortality, especially from 61 to 7%, which is quite significant, and to decrease the risk of HRS from 41 to 28%. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Oscar, for your wonderful talk uh, on a very pertinent issue. Uh, we... Uh, we uh, we have a couple of questions uh, for uh, uh, for Dr. Raja Fendi, but since we're also down to our last lecture, I think we will have a final uh, view from the chair, as well as uh, uh, the answer to those two questions once we're done with our last talk. The last talk is uh, is titled uh, Symptomatic Treatment in End-Stage Liver Disease with Regards to Psychosocial and Cultural Aspects. Now, uh, we must always realize that a patient isn't just a patient, a, a person, with uh, certain clinical issues. It is always a human being uh, with a complex set of psychosocial family and uh, uh, job-related issues that has come to you for treatment. So uh, without further ado, I would like to request Dr. Farooq Khan, our, uh, con uh, our associate and friend. Uh, he's a consultant hepatologist in, the, uh, in Leicester, and uh, he's a cr an accredited trainer in hepatology and transplant hepatology from Leeds. Uh, Dr. Farooq, uh, you may begin your talk 
on symptomatic treatment in end-stage liver disease with regards to psychosocial and cultural aspects. Thank you very much for the organizers at PSH for giving me the opportunity to talk about this um, very important topic, palliative care in liver disease. And I'm Farooq Khan, many of you know me. Um, I work in Leicester as a consultant hepatologist. What I'm going to cover in this um, talk today, so palliative care, do we actually need it? it? And if we do, what are the challenges? Why are we not able to meet those challenges? Once we overcome those, which is very important, I get asked fairly frequently by my trainees, when do I refer? And lastly, if we have time, I will touch upon symptom control. So why do we need it? Uh, liver disease is the third most common um, cause of death in the people of working class. That's why it's very relevant. Mortality is quite high. There's more than 1 million deaths worldwide in 2010. In the UK alone, in the last four decades, the mortality has gone up by 400%. In the United States, as you can see, there's about 200,000 hospital admissions per year, solely down to liver disease. Okay, 70% of patients with liver disease that die in hospital. And that's really the crux of the matter. This is very important. Do they really, this is a chronic phenomenon. This is not going to get better with time, if anything is going to get worse, particularly if they're not a transplant candidate. So why are they dying in hospital? Let me show you this. So Office of National Statistics, Public Health England um, has done some work and in the last the study lasting 2007 to 2011, and they looked at all cause mortalities from liver disease and they found that one in five patients have had five or more admissions in the last year of their life in the hospital. And if you look at particularly with alcohol related disease, 80% of them, they die in a &E. So right in the emergency department, no family around them, no much opportunities to discuss things, they just attend and they die 80%. A huge number really. More than one in 10 deaths of people are in the 40s. Really? What about Pakistan? There are two very important dynamics that I want to share with you about Pakistan. If you look at the age distribution, green is Pakistan, blue is Korea and yellow is Italy, you will see that 19 and under 50, Pakistan is leading. So we have the most young population, if you like, and as compared to other countries, of the world. The other important thing, if you look at the disease incidence, blue being the world and green being us, you also will see the hypertension, heart disease, as you can understand, globally there's more numbers, but if you look at liver disease, globally we are five times more to have liver disease. So we have a young population and we are five times more likely to have a liver disease. Let's have a look at Punjab. So this is um, Hepatitis Survey Punjab 2017, uh, done with PKLI. The population of Punjab with more than more than 110 million. Just looking at viral hepatitis, we know the infected population is around 10 million. Out of those, 2 million are cirrhotic. Now we know that 20% of those, 2 million, so there's around good 200,000 would decompensate in any given year. So if just sit back and think about it, if you have two lakh population of Punjab every year becoming decompensated, I don't think we can transplant, we don't have the resources, nor do we have the capacity to do the transplant. So, but these patients need to be looked after. So what are the challenges in palliative care now that we know that this is this is true? Let me take you through patient's journey. So we have a cirrhotic, 80% of those are compensated, 20% are decompensated. And we know that there's a huge healthcare burden associated to it. Three to five year mortalities. Once your patient decompensates, if you don't transplant him, we know that he or she 
will die from the first episode of decompensation to, to the death. It takes about three to five years. What levels do we provide care? Outpatient, inpatient, and ITU where you have ACLF. However, it's worth bearing in mind, once these patients of yours, they from decompensated, move down to ACLF syndrome, their mortality 28 day is much higher. So we're not talking years now, we're talking days. And that's why I think you need palliative care across all that regions. Outpatient care, inpatient care, and ACLF, even if the patient's in ITU. Okay, but now that you and I know that this is how we should do palliative care, so why don't we do well then? And I think there are three reasons, patient factors, profession-related factors and external factors. Let's look at the patient factors. So young patient with a variable trajectory. Murray has done the nice work in 2005, and I'd always love to show this. Let me explain you this for two seconds. So if you look at cancer, you start with a very high function. You carry on living a very normal life. That's where the diagnosis and you take a slum, you go down. So this, at this point, the death become very expected, and it happens in the matter of weeks and months. So everyone's rather comfortable with this and talking about how we can look after you in the end. Now, looking at the frailty, you start with a very, very low function and it continues to deteriorate either along at the lower level and then eventually you meet the death. Now, looking at the organ failure, particularly liver disease, look at this. You start from here. So your function is not that good. But every time you have an episode of decompensation, you dip down. You then improve, you then dip down. But if you look carefully, every time you dip down, you go low, you go low. At no point you come up and right to the same level and therefore it happens. And I think this is where a lot of confusion is. How can I make decision at this point that I'm not going to do any active treatment and I'm just going to end of life this patient? Because we, we've seen patients improve. Okay, well, let's talk about this. The other problems, deprivation in Pakistan, the distances are far too long. People living in the rural health settings are unable to reach. Strategic and government policies, I think there is definitely a lack, and that's where I think we as a professional need uh, huge resources and knowledge to go in and educate these strategic departments. There are uncertainties around symptom management. A lot of my trainees in particular, they, they concerns about pain management and said renal toxicity, understandably. Similarly, in cephalopathy, we know it can get worsened with opioids. What about the social and medical stigma? Palliative care for transplant candidate. Why? He's a transplant candidate. Well, and I'm, I'm going to show you with evidence in a minute that the, Palliative care does not mean it's end of life. Palliative care means looking after these patients to what is important for them, how well they want to live, whatever of the life is left. We'll talk about that in a minute. External factors. So Lancet Commission on Palliative Care, and they, they've shown that there are about 300 tons of morphine that gets distributed per year across the world. And how many comes to the low income countries, including Pakistan? Only 0.1 ton. That's amazing, isn't it? Similarly, very disproportionate number, 80%, 80% of these individuals who they thought to have needed this, they actually live in the low income and middle countries and therefore have a very severely limited access to any palliative care, even oral morphine. Quickly show you this map. USA gets the major share, so as a kind. But look at here, Afghanistan, Uganda, Nigeria, Pakistan is not quite on their map. We probably have a fairly noticeable distribution that gets there. So why not transplant then? Surely it's a cure, right? We 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 all know that if it's a, it's a decompensated patient, he'll he'll get better once he has a transplant. But what about too sick for transplant? Does every patient of yours? can have transplant. That's really not possible. And for so many reasons. I wanted to share you with this Mayo Clinic experience where they, when they looked at 555 patients who were referred to them for transplant, they actually found out that even if you refer your patient for transplant, there's a 50% chance 
that he will not be listed for transplant. He will found not to be eligible for it, right? Even though so, let's say he was fine and got accepted on the transplant, he is now waiting for transplant, 20% of them die whilst they're waiting or they get delisted because they become very unwell. They become too sick for transplant, as we've said earlier. What takes them off the list or what, what explains the mortality whilst they're waiting? So frailty, higher male score, as well as age. We have talked about frailty and I am very comfortable using the clinical frailty score four and five. What does that mean? How do I assess it very quickly in an outpatient? So if the patient is coming with one hand stick, right, he's frailty score four. Whereas on the other hand, if he's got a son or the family member holding him, or if he's walking with a walker or a Zimmer frame, then it's score five. Now the cutoff really is score five. We, we, we do know that if you have patients with a clinical frailty score of five and over six, then mortality for these as they reach the hospital due to any cause, not just the liver disease, chest infection, urine infection, any cause, the outcome is poor. The mortality is about six, uh, over 60% in three months. So these are the factors that we need to bear in mind before we start thinking about looking after these patients, referring them on transplant or whilst even they were on the transplant waiting list. So does palliative care help? Is it really important? Should we do that? So University of California, really nice study. What they did, they, all the patients been admitted, either they're transplant candidate or not, they've devised this new mechanism, which actually I am quite working in my hospital these days, uh, very closely with palliative care and this integral pathway whereby all the patients coming, liver disease, to the hospital, as much as we are doing in the first 48 to 72 hours, the treatment, IV albumin, antibiotics, they also got palliative care team involved and started to have discussion with family as well as the patients of what is important for them if they get listed or if they don't get listed. And look at this, of the total cohort that they enrolled for this study, which is 157, only 10% who pitched up to hospital were considered suitable for transplant. Therefore, very, very clear need for integration of these pathways. So if we know that this is very important, what are the risk factors that low and this group published that don't let it happen? And they thought the most important is lack of clinician knowledge of liver disease trajectories, ignorance of the benefits of palliative care, and lack of skills and the confidence in starting advanced care planning. And it is important, really, if for a trainee, for a lot of GPs sitting in the community, even for uh, specialist gastroenterologists, it is. I, I do find it sometimes very challenging. That how do I begin? So I'll show you how do I assess and what do I do about the palliative care? When do I start these conversations? Okay, so the first two you can use at outpatient and this one is for my inpatient. You, you, this is important to remember. So for example, if your child C being looked after an outpatient, you know that in a year's time, more than 50% chance of this patient sitting in front of you will not be there. Similarly, high MELD score mean higher mortality. ACLF we've already talked about. So I use these fairly frequently to sit down with the patient and the family and to talk it through. Because a lot of them, they ask, how long do we have? And I think it's very useful to talk to them. Look, it's difficult. However, what I can tell you that people in your situation, there's a good chance that half of them are not alive in one year's time. So please tell us, whilst we're making everything to make you feel better, what else can we do to keep you well? So not to keep you live longer, but to live you well, to help that. So how do I assess mortality? Ben Hudson, he was a trainee um, with us in Nottingham and now at Bristol. He's done a, a fairly decent amount of work published in Frontline Gastroenterology about three years ago. And he said, if you have managed to look at five independent risk factors, you will know that the mortality of your patient in a one year at about 72%. And you don't need massive uh, working tools for this. So poor prognosis if your child C, if you have more than two hospital admissions in the last one year, if ongoing alcohol consumption, if you're not a transplant candidate, or if your performance status score is three or more, any of three 
of these will mean that the mortality is really, really poor. And therefore, we think, and this is what I very much recommend, that you start integrated care pathway or discussion with the family. Okay, Ben, and how do I refer? So more than two admissions in the last six months. Actually, if it's in the last six months, that's as good as you to have thinking about. Refractory societies, child C, encephalopathy grade two or above, old age, frailty, ACLF, and HCC, even if patient with HCC is on the waiting list. So when do I start conversation? What, what are the times for me? I look for opportunities. So for trainees in the room, please make sure that if your patient has come into hospital and this is his second admission with the same problem, either encephalopathy, either GI bleed or um, with ascites or with HRS or with AKI due to diuretics and you're finding a very difficult balance in between the two, trying to manage renal function of diuretics with ascites, then I think it's very reasonable that on the second admission discharge, you take the opportunity. We need to look for these opportunities, telltale signs, as I call them. And you go and talk to the patient, you go and talk to the relatives. Okay. The second thing that I normally do is when I see the decline at the outpatient basis, I offer them a dedicated appointment. Either the family or patient itself or the care, whichever you prefer, and talk them through, make them aware, get them ready. And the third thing which we are very keen on doing is ma make a combination with, if you do lucky to have a cancer uh, department and if they have a palliative team, go get, talk to them. And um, I'm doing one uh, clinic a month uh, with my palliative care and we just see liver patients in those. So look for opportunities. Right, symptom management, I don't have much time left as we expected, but to be fair, a lot of these have already been covered. There are very subtle points that I want to make about pain, and I'll, I'll just... So nephropam, I, I'm not sure whether it's available in Pakistan, but it's a non-opioid and it's executed in feces, and it is really, really safe um, um, in, in patient delivery. If you have available, that's fine. If you do not have that available, then your second order WHO ladder like codeine and dihydrocodeine, I don't tend to use them to be fair. And um, because I think you have, what you have to bear in mind, there are two pathways that usually an analgesics uses, either glucuronidation or oxidation. Oxidation is really impaired. So therefore the, the, meth, the, the analgesics that use that pathway, try not to use them because we know that in an already struggling level, you put them even more stress. Tramadol, not ideal, but I know it's available in Pakistan and I think you should try Tramadol. Maybe start at 50 milligram once a night and, and, and titrate it up. I, I wouldn't give more than like 50 milligram four times a day because I think that will have bearing on it. And the second, of course, is um, morphine. If Tramadol is not working, then I think one can always move to morphine uh, or morphine is fine. Nausea and vomiting, metaclopramide is equally good. I don't think I would advocate anything more than that. Cyclizine, try not to use it because there's really increased risk of uh, sedation in these patients, particularly the ones who have got decompensated liver disease. And metaclopramide, as I said, is fairly frequently available um, that you can use and it should be used. Lastly, uh, agitation. It says um, agitation usually comes in the very end stages of liver disease. And I think it's entirely reasonable to keep it um, for, for end stages. And things that you can use, you can use lorazepam, you can use diazepam, uh, oral is fine. And if patient is really agitated, grade three, grade four in cephalopathy and, and very irritable, there's no harm that you use it in a, in a two mil syringe, uh, in a one milligram, and you just squirt it in the buccal cavity propping them up and it will just get absorbed and dissolved. And even that, that would help. So you need to think about the symptoms management. This is how we do it. The most important thing that I really wanted to come across is in summary are the key priorities. How do I identify these patients to have a timely discussion? Once you have that communication to the family and advanced care planning, that is really, really relevant. And the last thing, which is very close to my heart, I think is education and team building. Please train your nurses, train your staff, 
give their contact numbers and to be able to provide the care that our patient with liver disease need. I stop it here. Thank you. Yes, we can. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Farooq Khan, for the wonderful talk. This was the last talk of the day. And we would be wrapping up today's session with uh, uh, a few questions from the audience, uh, which you would be shortly seeing on your screen, uh, followed uh, by um, uh, uh, our uh, observations from our eminent panel, chairpersons. So the questions, uh, these, um, the first question is, what is the scope of beta blocker therapy, selective or non-selective in the management of cirrhotic cardiomyopathy? Uh, I would like to uh, direct this question towards Dr. Raja Effendi. I know it's very late in Kuala Lumpur right now, but if Dr. Effendi is up uh, and with us, it, uh, it would be great to have his opinion uh, on this question. Dr. Effendi, can you hear us? All right, Dr. Effendi isn't available. Uh, uh, can I request uh, uh, the chairpersons, one of the chairpersons, Dr. Shahab Abid, uh, to, uh, to give his opinions on the use of beta blockers in the management of cirrhotic cardiomyopathy? Any experience that he might have had? Dr. Farooq Khan, uh, can we have your opinions on this question? The scope of beta blocker therapy, uh, selective or non-selective in the management of cirrhotic cardiomyopathy. Now, uh, cirrhotic cardiomyopathy is, is uh, well, it's not a very commonly recognized pathology. It might be commoner than we think. Perhaps we're missing it. But in your experience, Dr. Farooq Khan, uh, any use of beta blockers in this particular pathology? G. Farooqi sahab, we can hear you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, till the Farooq uh, is unmuted. Well, in uh, this uh, cardiomyopathy, the, uh, comparing the selective and non-selective, the yeah. beta receptor antagonists, they, we know that they reduce the cardiac output uh, by lowering the portal pressure and portal flow. In this regard, the non-selective beta blockers such as propanolol, nedolol, and timolol are more effective than if you use the selective beta-1 blockers, uh, which the cardiologists do use, in this reducing the hepatic venous pressure gradient. So here, the non-selective has got an edge because they don't work only on the, uh, 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 the cardiac output. They also have the other effects as well. So this is the... But definitely, I agree with uh, Nan that... Uh, probably we are missing these cases. We are not diagnosing these cases to the extent that it should be. Uh, so uh, here the non-selective has got an edge because it has got the uh, other effects as well, which reduce the uh, uh, venous return to these uh, uh, failing heart. So this is just simple brief uh, answer on my end. If there is more to uh, add to it, Altaf Sahib by you or by Farooq, so they can or by Professor Asnain Ali Shah sir. Adnan, can you hear me? Yeah, yes, Dr. Farooq, we can hear you clearly. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Finally. <laughs> uh, yes, yes. Um, <laughs> agree with Prof. Farooq. Look, uh, there, there are certain things in this management of cirrhotic cardiomyopathy, which is really, really relevant. Always, always should manage it in combination with the cardiologist. That's a point number one. If you have a cardiomyopathy and cirrhotic, but you are not decompensated, then the usual beta blockers and the management remains in the hands of a cardiologist and the beta blockers that they normally prefer are the rate limiters, which are absolutely fine. To be honest, there's nothing wrong with it. However, it is not uncommon that cardiologists on the one that I look after these cohort of patients, they tend to ask me when the ascites starts to pitch in and the symptoms of portal hypertension or decompensated cirrhosis, if you like, uh, uh, jumps in. And I think at that point, you would treat that exactly as you would treat your liver cirrhosis that is decompensated, where, where, whereby non-selective beta blockers does have a potential role. I tend to, to be honest, I tend to scope these patients very, very early on because I do know that there's another potential problem with these, that they, with their cardiomyopathy, their risk of ischemic heart disease is much more higher than your and my other um, portal 
pressure problem or cirrhotic patients. So I think it's very early on. We tend to ban them fairly quickly before they actually develop uh, SI because we know once they go into severe phases, it really becomes a real potential problem uh, because their heart really isn't in the good neck. And from the from palliative point of view, uh, we have this conversation fairly early on. Thank you, Dr. Thank Farooq. You. Any uh, any opinion or observation from our respected chairpersons? Uh, can I make a comment? Uh, yes, sir. of course, sir. Yes. Welcome. Yeah, uh, I think this is the uh, cohort of such patients uh, who uh, have a low cardiac output and they are hypotensive. So use of uh, beta blockers must be weighed in very carefully with, like Dr. Farooq said, with the uh, consultation of the cardiologist. And they must have uh, uh, echocardiogram, uh, either TEE, uh, to determine whether it is a right heart strain or a left heart strain. And if it's a right heart strain, they actually do better with the uh, phosphodiesterase inhibitors in addition to the uh, beta blockers. And that has to be decided in conjunction with the cardiologist because this is not just a one-off problem. It will probably continue to uh, to haunt these patients uh, as they follow up. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Noir. Uh, any uh, any observations from any of the other respected chair members, Professor Hasnan, Professor Farooqi, Dr. Shahab Abed, and our facilitator, Professor Altaf Alam? Uh, no, I think we have. Uh, cardiology colleagues should be on board with such patients and we should make a joint decision. Thank you. Uh, the second question, in refractory or resistance ascites, what should be the dose of beta blockers? Now, since uh, Dr. Effendi is away, I would direct this question towards Dr. Farooq Khan. Dr. Farooq, can you hear us? Okay. Uh, any any observations or opinion on this question from uh, Professor uh, Husnan Ali Shah or Professor Anwar Ahmed Khan? Well, uh, uh, go ahead, please. Yeah, uh, Professor Anwar Sir. Gee, uh, I think in refractory uh, resistant societies, you have to first meet the definition of resistant societies, which has been <clears throat> very nicely elucidated in the earlier talks. Uh, the dose of beta blockers obviously has to be tailored on individual patient. Uh, because in refractory societies, there's a tense abdomen. And if you do a large volume paracentesis, which you with the patient will need uh, either that or tips uh, there is going to be drop in the blood pressure therefore the uh, dose of beta blocker has to be tailored on individual patient there is no set rules of what dose will be a, a sort of a generalized recommendation uh, the blood pressure should not fall below 90 uh, especially after uh, the lvp and uh, this has to be monitored on the bedside by the monitoring nurses or the doctors, and the doctors have to be on board with, for these patients with uh, LVP. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I totally agree with Professor Anwar Saab. You see, in patients with refractory ascites, uh, they're uh, mostly dependent upon the cardiac output to maintain an adequate arterial blood pressure. And uh, by potentially, if we give them the and non-selective beta blockers in the usual dosages, uh, it may lead to decrease in kidney perfusion and hepatorenal syndrome even. So uh, yes, the, it, the, the, the dose needs to be individualized and we should be aiming at the uh, lowest safe day, uh, dose in these cases. We cannot give the same doses as we are giving in the patients where ascites is not that level. I totally agree with Professor Nwar Saab. But again, this is a very uh, difficult patients to treat with and to balance the effect and uh, drawbacks of these drugs. Precisely, sir. The, so the main issue is low intravascular volume. Um, uh, we go on to the last question. Uh, uh, 
Uh, when should we be stopping secondary prophylaxis in spontaneous bacterial peritonitis? I believe uh, the guidelines have it out uh, in the clear that uh, it should continue. Can uh, uh, observations from uh, Dr. Farooq Khan? Yeah, uh, absolutely. That it, to be honest, it, first episode of SPP and the second, it is really, really a bad prognostic sign. Um, if, if, if you would have heard my ACLF talk, a lot of studies are being done on this. It's the infection that drives the ongoing hepatocellular inflammation, and that's what kills our patient. That's the basis of ACLF syndrome. So please, please, please do not stop it. Do not stop it. Um, SPP recurrent is a potential bad prognostic factor. That the outcome is much higher within the first 12 months. So don't stop it. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Farooq. Very crisp and precise uh, directions there. Any uh, concluding observations or remarks from our respected facilitator, Professor Altaf Alam, our eminent chairpersons, uh, before we conclude today's session? Can I make a couple of comments? Yes, sir. I think uh, all the talks were uh, excellent and thoroughly enjoyed them. Uh, there is uh, uh, one observation which I'm sure uh, most of us uh, experience in our uh, practice that as soon as the patients with uh, ascites or potential SPP land in the emergency room, there is a knee jerk reaction of doctors in the emergency room to immediately start on antibiotics. That has to be really indoctrinated to stop them from prescribing antibiotics before taking culture, before taking the acetic fluid for analysis. And that really complicates, like Dr. Nasir Luck has uh, very nicely elucidated a case of a MDR in which you have a multi-drug resistant. And then you have a choice of potentially very dangerous drugs with potential uh, problems of uh, renal toxicity and uh, they are the last resorts. That's one observation. The other one is about uh, Dili. Uh, Dr. Bilal had very nicely covered uh, Dili in cirrhotic patients. And uh, in, in Pakistan, at least, I have observed that every patient walks in your office with uh, at least 12 drugs. And you end up canceling or stopping all drugs and convincing them that there is no need and they are potentially dangerous. I think this is one of the important aspect that we must ask ourselves a question for each drug which is being given to the patient, whether he needs it or not. And like uh, it was very nicely uh, shown in his data that the drugs which are needed are the least uh, prescribed or uh, least uh, uh, complied with. So these are the very important messages that I think we should drive home with. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Noir. Any observations from our facilitator, Professor Altaf, or any of the other chairpersons? Uh, thank you very much, Adnan. Um, thank you, sir. I thoroughly, you. Enjo uh, thoroughly enjoyed. Uh, your moderation was very good. Um, congratulations. The, the talks were very top class. I learned a lot. I sat through the whole session of four and a half hours. And, uh, you know, at my age, it's not easy, but uh, I was so overwhelmed by the age, knowledge. <laughs> 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 but uh, the talks were so good that I really couldn't move. So all uh, praise for everyone behind the scenes. Um, of course, I can see Arif and Zishan running around the IT team, everyone, uh, really thank you very much for uh, making it possible. Uh, of course, with a lot of glitches, but you know, uh, certainly you made it possible. Uh, thank you very much, everyone, all the speakers, all behind the scene workers, Zishan, Arif Nawaz, uh, and Adnan, you as well. Thank you very much. Well, Adnan, make light mode pay. Uh, I think we should close it. Ki, 
आप लोग ने जितनी मेहनत की प्रोफेसर आरिफ अमीर नवाज हैज गिवन मी एन ऑप्शन टू इनिशिएट द मॉर्निंग सेशन प्रोसीडिंग्स राइट नाउ सो वी मे मूव ऑन टू आवर फर्स्ट टॉक एक्सीलेंट मॉडरेटर आई हैड टू कम कहा कि अब तो नींद बनती है अब तो आप लोगों की नींद बनती अब सो जाए आई नो कि आप पिछले 36 आवर्स से जागे हुए हैं अभी सो जाए हमें अनाउंस किया स्पेशल अदनान सलीम सेशन फ्रॉम 12 मिडनाइट 8 इन द मॉर्निंग आप जाने रहे हमारे साथ थैंक यू वेरी मच इट्स माई प्लेजर ये तो इट्स अ वेरी स्मॉल एफर्ट दैट आई कैन डू टू सपोर्ट द कॉज रेली पार्ट ऑफ मी फील एम्बेस्ड कि मैं इससे ज्यादा कॉन्ट्रीब्यूट नहीं कर पाया बट आई एम रियली वॉट यू गाज आर डूइंग और इन शजीज आई होप कि कल का दिन आज से बेहतर होगा परसों का कल से बेहतर होगा इन शुड नाइट फ्रॉम थैंक यू